and it should expand into the okay. all right i see the little live icon even though it's buffering i know it's uh we're still there uh so here we are we're back we uh, i apologize for the technical difficulties that we were having uh getting things uh reconnected over here but we're, we are finally back uh looking forward to all of you and the keith allen show audience to jump back in here with us and partake in some questions that you may have for my uncle rudy and my cousin uh rudy jr or the second uh we were talking all about the names and uh surnames and we were starting off on getting uh some answers to questions i had for my uncle rudy <laughs> about uh some of the children uh we were talking about last uh john david uh, uh what is it uh nava cheveria uh so we left on that and then i was going to start progressing into uh talking about more of his growing up his childhood and working our way up into his military career uh as this is a uh a a show a pre-show for the veterans day coming up the 11th of november of 2020 uh, so this is a special edition of the Keith Allen Show here with my uncle, who is a Korean combat veteran and a Purple Heart recipient. Uh, he served in the United States Army back in 1949 and 50 and, and, and some and then on. And then we have our cousin Rudy to our left here, uh, who served recently. So he's uh, one of the new breed of the family members that serve. Uh, matter of fact, mentioning family, it is uh, we are a military family. Uh, as you can see, some of the posters that are in the background over there. Uh, I'm going to get a close-up shot of my Uncle Rudy there. And in the background, you can see there, we have Rudy Jr. right there up on the top left. We have Bobby Jr. on the bottom left. Uh, and then uh, we have Uncle Rudy behind him on his uh, left side of his head there. That's him when he was, uh, what were you, 17, 18 years old? 17 years old. 17 years old damn. right there. <laughs> and we got a big damn from uh, Rudy Jr. over here. So yeah, so all right, so let's uh, take the background music off and then let's uh, get uh, get on with the show again. This is going to be part two of the live broadcast special edition of the Keith Allen Show uh, pre uh, Veterans Day, uh, uh, taking a step back in time with Uncle Rudy here. Uh, thank you for coming back, Bonita Salinas. Thank you very much for uh, sticking out with us here. We appreciate that very much. All right, so let's uh, let's continue on here. So once again, we have Rudy Jr. to uh, my left, who's right there. That's me. And then Uncle Rudy here to uh, my front there. And uh, uh, don't worry about the picture that's up on the top of his head there. Uh, that's just me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> So uh, so let's continue on here. So, OK, we're going to we're going to get back in time. Let's, let's go back in time because, I, you know, it is so awesome. Uh, the time we came for your birthday, we you had a birthday recently and mm -hmm. Kathy and I, my better half, which once again, I want to remind the audience that Kathy, uh, my sunshine, better half is behind us as well as uh, Rudy uh, Jr. Hey, wait a minute. You get that I just said Rudy right? Jr. It's the same thing. <laughs> I just said you're Rudy Jr. Oh, my God. You have to watch part one of the Keith Allen show to to uh, figure that one out again. But cousins are behind me. <laughs> cousins and Sunshine are behind me. They will be interjecting at some, uh, some point or another. Uh, you mentioned something about a camera. Or... Yeah, you can use your uh, computer laptop camera. Shoot it back. Just show them. And then. Yeah, I don't know if, uh, if I'll be able to do that. Yeah, with true, my... true. I wouldn't trust you. Yeah, it. my 18 Mini. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> we all been, we're all been drinking right now. Oh, we're, that's we're what it is. It. Oh, I might be a little <laughs> loud there. I, I'm a little loud on my mic. You're, talk, uh, you're talking to a tech savvy here, uh, yeah. grandson. No, 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 tech savvy. <laughs> I, forget, yeah. I know. I forget. I'm all on top of my microphone right there, and I shouldn't be. I could be laid back, just relaxing a little bit. Um, so anyway, we're gonna get back into talking about. I want to ask you. I know there's a lot of questions that I might forget, or things that I might forget to ask. But if I do, maybe uh, Rudy back here can shout out something, or come back and talk with us about it. But I want to go way back in time uh, to when you're a young boy. And then we're going to work our way up into the time when you uh, decided to enlist in the Army. And there's a little unique uh, story about when you try to enlist there. Um, and then also uh, we're going to get to uh, ask some questions. Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, we're going to ask some questions uh, to Cousin Rudy over here. Uh, after I do a little technical troubleshooting for Kathy over here. Um, Double tap something or what? No, see, it's, you know, it's funny because when oh. I showed her the first time, it worked. And then now it's not uh, working because we're trying to get it to where she could put a, oh there just put a like comment right there. Yeah, so. but it's not letting me comment to people like mine does. 
Oh, oh, see, yeah, because we ha I have the the uh, regular uh, Android, and she has the i i iPhone, so it's a little learning curve going on back there and behind the scenes over here. But uh, they'll work that out. Uh, most interesting is uh, getting back to your uh, your story of the night uh, timeline. We're going to go back into the 1930s. Uh, Uncle Rudy, I want to ask you from the time in the 1930s, uh, you uh, mentioned uh, when we spoke, uh, when I, I was actually starting to talk about when I was here at your birthday party, what's really unique is that we get into conversations and it flows so easily, the conversations and things just come out and they spew out so easily and nicely. Uh, I know it's a little, sometimes a little more uh, difficult or you get under pressure uh, trying to think of things quickly, but Let's try to relax a little bit with uh, thinking of the timeline. And let's talk about the times in the 30s when you were raised in a time of poverty. And let's let's hear about that, your time back then in the in the 30s when you're a young boy. Okay. <clears throat> I was born, I was raised, um, I was born and raised in the actual, the heart of Los Angeles. Um, the heart of Los Angeles is Overo Street and uh, I was born away, uh, one block away from Alvaro Street. And uh, uh, the first few years we traveled, the, my family moved from uh, uh, Macy into Bunker Hill, Alpine, Dogtown. And Dogtown is where I spent most of my growing up, uh, my preteen years. And um, while I was growing there in, uh, in Dogtown, uh, we used to go swimming after uh, got out of grammar school. We used to go to LA, uh, LA River swimming, and that was before it was cemented over. And uh, it was a it was a lot of. Um, Wait a minute! Uh, it wasn't cemented at that time. It was no, no. It was it, mud it, or what? It wasn't cemented. It was natural. Oh, just, okay. So just dirt or mud underneath yeah, it, and just natural. Was... You know, you had fish. You had uh, crayfish. Uh, you had uh, what? You had fish in there too? Yeah, you had what fish the? and crayfish, you know, in certain areas, you know, and uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, vegetation, some fruit trees, and uh, then they cemented. In fact, we were we were swimming towards the end when they were uh, putting up the columns uh, for the bridges, and uh, they were cementing it over until they ran us out. Uh, so you, you also grew up in a, a predominantly Italian and Mexican neighborhood, right? Around yeah, the projects? There, there was, a, a, it was an Italian Mexican uh, uh, neighborhood. Did you learn any Italian around those Italian people? Uh, no. Uh, well, we, they spoke um, Spanish and Italian back then. You know, you could understand each other. Uh, it was closely compared to now. You know, it's, uh, it's way different. And you also mentioned there was a lot of Jewish people in the in the Boyle Heights area as well at the time. Yeah, Boyle Heights uh, was uh, predominant Jewish and Russian, uh, and um, you know, uh, there were other ethnic groups, but they were around Los Angeles. Like you had your uh, Filipinos in Bunker Hill, you had your Japanese in Little Tokyo, you had your um, Chinese where the Union Station is now. And uh, they've expanded into North Broadway. Um, so let me let me ask you as well as uh, boxcars. What, what's up with uh, what's going on with the boxcars you rode on uh, trains? Boxcars. Oh, well, you know when uh, when we used to go swimming in the river, you know sometimes we we come out, you know, and uh, there would be trains leaving, you know, moving out, and uh, we go up there, and you know we we jump on the on the just the railings, not in the boxcar, in the railings, just for a little ride, you know, to a certain location. And uh, then we would just jump off. Now, you uh, said Dogtown was a grammar school, right, that you went to in Dogtown? Yeah, this was... Uh, Ann Street, in, right? Into grammar school and... Um, uh, Ann Street? Uh, was it, it was on Ann Street you mentioned? Yeah, Ann Street was the first sque school that I uh, uh, went to. Okay, Ann so... Street. And... Uh, you know, I used to miss a lot of school, so uh, uh, they transferred me to uh, Paducah Elementary School in Chavez Ravine, which is uh, Dodger Stadium now. Uh, I was there from 1942 to 1945 when I graduated. LA champions now. 
Huh? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 right, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, nice yeah. place to be right now. Yeah. And from uh, from there, I graduated in 45. I went to uh, Central Junior High School, which was in Bunker Hill. And uh, I was there one year, and uh, they decided to make the freeway, the Hollywood Freeway, and it took a third of the school. So they closed the school down, and uh, we were allowed to go to... Um, uh, Virgil, South Central, or uh, Nightingale. I chose Nightingale to go there, and uh, uh, it was a lot, of, predominantly white, and uh, there was over there in the Huntington, uh, uh, on Cyprus. Hey, let me get back, you, uh, you step back a little bit. You had mentioned something about uh, Pachucos back then. Oh, uh, yeah, and... Uh, yeah, some, Dogtown. some early signs of the Pachuco time. Yeah, in Dogtown is uh, my first experience with uh, with the Pachucos. You know their 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 dress code, uh, their haircuts, shoes. You know, and um, it was a it was a mod. You know, like any other mode of dress. You know that uh, uh, young generations you know use, and uh, they were sharp. They were clean. Everything. You know, and. Uh, um, in fact, there was some of them there were in a, uh, have a having, instead of having the dog tail, they had a mohawk. Oh, wow. Yeah, a mohawk? A, mohawk, a, a pachuco? Yeah, yeah a mohawk. You know, oh, I saw no. one of them. Yeah, so. I seen the airborne guys wearing the, the, those kind of mohawks uh, yeah. in some of the videos of World War II. Uh, well, well, you know, when, when I was getting ready to go to combat in Korea, in Shan Landing, uh, there was a lot of us that had the... Uh, we cut our hair down to a mohawk because, uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to be keeping up with our, our appearance, you know, combing and all that. So, Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Let me stick back uh, also a little bit and talk about a mural in school that was that you did or, and yeah. was photographed. Uh, at Paducah Junior High, I mean, the elementary school, uh, one of my teachers was um, um, a fan of uh, Diego Rivera, the Mexican muralist. And uh, she had been to Mexico on one on summer vacation. She came back, and she had a a, a book of postcards of Diego Rivera's uh, drawings. And uh, she had seen me scribbling and, and you know drawing a few things on paper. And she asked me if I was willing to, if I could uh, draw a, a a mural of uh, those paintings. Excuse mm -hmm. me. Let me let me interject a little bit before you continue on right there, Theo. Uh, I, I just want to recognize some of the people who are saying hello to you. Uh, uh, there's uh, Ermalinda. She says hello to us. Uh, Bonita Salinas is saying hello to us. Uh, Marta Morales Lopez uh, saying hello to you. Uh, Cory Silva, uh, my brother, uh, your your nephew. Yeah. Uh, Cory Silva is uh, in here saying hello. Uh, so there are a few people that are just saying hello to you and uh, recognizing uh, that uh, you're here giving an interview with us. So yeah. I just wanted to interject on that. Okay. You know, and uh, I know Ricky was on here earlier, but I don't see him uh, right now. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that we will get to uh, Cousin Rudy over here and, and asking him some questions very briefly uh, about uh, some of his experiences in, in his military career shortly as well. Um, uh, but we're going to continue on just a little bit more. Yeah, Corey says, hello, Theo, from Corey. Oh, hi. Uh, and so there you go. He says, hello. Um, uh, so Martha is grocery shopping. She does multitasking and quadruple tasking. So she's uh, she's pretty busy, but she still has time to get on the phone. Corey says, love you, Theo. Love you, too. <laughs> All right. Lady of my Say hi to my sister. There you go. Lady, yeah, yeah, matter of fact, uh, his sister is my mother, Helen. Uh, so he's saying hi to mom. Corey Silva, mom says hi to her brother. <laughs> there you go, Theo. She says yeah. hello to you, too. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, we do have Cousin Rudy here, too. Uh, and this is, I keep wanting to say, we have Cousin Rudy here, too, Junior. I, I mean, the second, I, I mean, the third, uh, the second, and then, you know, so I'm like, <laughs> but no, I would say he's, the, the way I, I, I mentioned we're going to do this is Uncle Rudy's one, Rudy one, Rudy two next to me on my lap, Rudy three behind me. So that, that's, uh, no, Rudy one. Rudy two behind me and Rudy three to my left. That's the way. There you yeah. go. Now I got it right now. So we have Rudy uh, thir uh, the second behind us as well. So they can shout out anything whenever they want to. And uh, we'll for we're not going to get mad. We'll forgive them because I told them 
that this is going to be an open forum show, uh, a family show that where they can uh, project anything they want to project or interject. Um, all right, so let's get back to uh, uh, talking about uh, your gang activity in the neighborhood of Macy Street. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, um, after uh, they tore down the uh, uh, neighborhood in Dogtown <clears throat> to build a project, housing projects, we moved to Macy, and Macy was the original place where I was born, on Avila Street. And uh, that's where my adolescent life started coming. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was a teenager then, and uh, there's a lot of gang activity. You know, some of our rivals were Alpine, La Loma, um, mm, well, that's about two, those two were the main ones. But there was a lot of other gangs out there. Yeah, and then and, you uh, didn't want no part of that, though. Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, when you're when you're growing up with a group of uh, of kids, you know, um, you don't want to be uh, um, uh, an outcast. Yeah, like you're an the outcast, troublemaker. You know? yeah. So you you go, you go along with the movement. You know, you you're you're part of the uh, the environment. You know, and uh, I was involved in some gang fights, and uh, I wasn't proud of it. You know, and uh, I didn't. I didn't send any any sense in it because a lot of a lot of teenagers got killed, innocent, for for little thing, minor things. So yeah. I decided to join the army. And uh, some of my other buddies, when they found out, well, go back. Um, uh, watching all these movies, war movies during the the war, Second World War, um, I saw a lot of Marine movies. And uh, so I figured I'd join the Marines. When I went to the uh, recruiting office, uh, the recruiters ran me out because uh, I was too thin. I weighed 130 pounds, skinny, tall, lanky, and uh, they ran me out. I remember I, I, we were talking about this uh, yeah. before this uh, setup day of this interview, and uh, I was mentioning to you that it sounded familiar, like an Audie Murphy thing, yeah. where Audie Murphy went through the same thing. It's like, no, uh, we, we, we uh, you know, make men, men out of boys, but you're too much for us, so yeah. you go somewhere else. But uh, so, but you, you, uh, so now I had asked you as well because I was a bit confused when you said you went in and, and tried to join, but they said you're too thin and all that. I, I was a bit confused because uh, you were actually at a recruiting station uh, that was, did it have numerous recruiting, uh, like Marines, Navy, Army, or? No, no, was it? it was just uh, Marines. It was at the federal building on uh, North uh, Main and uh, Temple. Uh, and uh, they ran me off. And uh, so, you know, I felt bad, you know, and, uh, mad at the same time, you know, because they did that. So uh, after Christmas uh, in 48, I went to Ball Heights and they had an army recruiting office there on uh, Brooklyn and Chicago. So um, I joined, you know, Sergeant Landau was there. I still remember his name, you know. And he signed me up right away. And uh, so uh, when my some of my friends found out, you know, there was five of them that uh, joined the service also. But as we got into basic training, uh, more into uh, the uh, process, uh, one of them was declared a 4F and the other one was joined, uh, switched to the Air Force. So there was three of us that uh, stayed in. One went in for two years and me and another friend went in for, uh, we enlisted for three years. Okay, so let me uh, let me stop you there just from mm -hmm. briefly uh, because I do want to get into asking uh, cousin Rudy some questions as well. Yeah, uh, Rudy the third here uh, about uh, when he started thinking about uh, army service, military service, or anything. So, how young were you when you first started thinking anything military uh, at, before you know you are knowing that your uncle, your grandpa was involved? Honestly, like the truth. When I actually like decided, well, not decided, but when I got super interested into uh, like military anything, is when um I remember it too. It was at my, it was I think it was Christmas time. I don't remember my, uh, I forget what time, but it was at my uncle David's. It was his old house, and my cousin brought like his uh he brought his PS2 and or it was my uncle's. I forget, but he brought a Medal of Honor. It was a video game. 
Oh, and, Medal but, of Honor. Okay. But they showed the it was the beginning part where it was, um, was D Day during the Normandy landings, and I don't know, it was just I don't know, it was the action or anything, but I just liked it. But then after that, from that point on, I'd always just been interested. Not, I would say I was interested in uh, the weapons and like you know just normal stuff. But when growing up. I just started to learn more about the weapons, like what do they use during these conflicts? And then from there, I got more into actually the military history and like, well, this war was during this time, but you know what caused that war? Like, like I found out more wars about like War of 1812, Revolution, Spanish American, uh, the Banana Wars, the War of Mexico. And that was had the first, um, the first amphibious uh, landing for the U.S. was the war with Mexico, which is really cool to find out. Now, let me ask you, where did you start finding this out? In school or oh, on was, your own? It was school. I was bored one day just going through my soul study work because I didn't want to do homework. So I was just going through it, and I found out the War of 1812. So I just read about that for a little bit. And then from that on, I just liked, liked history. And then, you know, just gradually I was going more towards the military. I don't you know. So I was a kid, too. So I wanted to be like a race car driver or a fire truck. I wanted to be a fire truck. I wrote that for some reason. Let me ask you, in school, did they ever ask you anything about or, or tell you, would you want to be a doctor, fireman, or policeman? Or are they, because when I was a young kid, that's all they asked us. They asked us, what do, you, what do you want to be when you're growing up? A fireman, policeman, or a doctor? Three things they only asked us. We didn't have no open forum to choose anything else. I wonder how much it's changed. Do, do they refer to any of that nowadays to you and your teachers when they ask you anything like that about what you want to be when you grow up well i'm i mean, got i got all that stuff before it's just i don't know it's like that was a long time ago i don't really remember but i remember getting asked that like what do you want to do after and like i didn't know what i want to do i was like i want to join the military service and then at the end like i was just learning more about like uh just joining and i was kind of off putting at the end of it but it was more towards like senior i mean my parents they knew my was it my my Nino Frank? He knew and like like I'll join eventually, and it was more towards the end of the when I was in senior year of high school. I was like, well, I gotta do good in school because I saw the recruiters. There. So I was like, yeah, I want to do a join, and after that, I was like I did better in school because I actually knew what I wanted to do. They need a GED, so I did better in school. And I after that, I told my mom. Oh my! I told my mom she was actually um, it was that it was during a what was it? It was a back to school night. I met the recruiters. I talked to them, but the way I told my mom was she was sleeping, and um, I went up there like, "Hey, I'm I'm gonna go join the the army," and I just left the card right there. Oh my god! Yeah, and then uh, <laughs> wait a minute, wait wait wait. So she was sleeping. She was sleeping, and you, and you said, "I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna just leave her a note." And I didn't even know I left her the arm the recruiter's card. The card. And Ooh, I, like, I haven't heard a story like that before. So this is pretty unique. This is pretty neat. Uh, knowing uh, knowing how this is going so uh you and so it wasn't something that you that you did lively like hey mom guess what look at what i did <laughs> what did you feel like she was gonna like to try to stop you or did you feel like you you had to do that for a reason or i mean it was my choice i mean i wasn't 17 i was 18 at the time i was already a considered an adult you know buying cigarettes and all that stuff <laughs> oh i oh, see nah, nah, okay i didn't really, do, I didn't really <laughs> get into all that stuff but yeah. um no, I just, they knew, like, my dad knew, my, everyone knew, like, but just, when was I going to make that decision? And that was the day. So after that, just started doing better in school, try to get the points where I was, like, lack, lacking in classes, like, with Fs. So I tried at least to get into good old Ds. So, so it was pass. because of the military that brought you yeah. to get your grades back up. It's like, when you want to know what you want to do, you actually get a lot better to figure out. You try to focus in school. But anyways, um, so that was it. That was, like, that's when I wanted to decide. But... It was during my whole life, just from the days, like, just hearing about, learning about, you know, World War II. And I was really into World War II and the history. And then later, like, because we talk, even though, like, we come here, we talk about the history of wars and the movies. And, you know, I wasn't, I was influenced, but I think it was me that was more just pushing the drive, you know, because there's something, it's different. It's not like I'm at a nine to five job and that's I, so I can't do that i can't just sit in an office all day it's just it's boring yeah I and then it's like everyone's saying you got to go to college you got to do this you gotta and then you're twenty thousand dollars in debt and it's, it's it wasn't it was like i don't like school in the first place and then, but you know i just made it to pass and then um now i'm out of the military i'm 
got a really good credit score. Well, I'm not out of the military, actually. I'm, I'm still in, I don't know why I said that. National Guard. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's pretty much out. So, yeah. So you, um, you and you, you uh, is if I'm correct or not correct, you enlisted before your cousin Bobby? Or oh, yeah. About the oh, same time My or cousin, so? if he was here, I wish he was a key, um, he tried to join the Marines. And I thought he was going to go for that, but um, then he said something about his eyes and his paperwork. It just sounded like they tried to, like, push it off because they got back in those days what was it it was um i don't know i think it was like right after iraq or something but like the, the military standards um were going higher because they were trying to reduce the military costs at that time like so they didn't want people just jumping in so they had a lot of restrictions on tattoos and waivers and everything i remember he was like because he had a uh stigma yeah yeah, stigma, yeah so, they, so the marines are saying are you saying with the marines they just lost his paperwork and um, yeah, so I was like, oh yeah, we lost your paperwork, and then um, that was it. And then, and then he was off doing whatever. And then when I joined, I was like, all right, do drugs? Like, no, I don't do drugs. And like, all right, you're good to go. And they sent me off. <laughs> oh my god, that sounds pretty pretty easy. Yeah, the army takes anyone. <laughs> so and then you, uh, you, how often would you speak to your grandfather about? Any, did you ask him anything? How Keith, it was like for him? Or Keith, can I say something? Oh yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, he forgot to mention something, uh, Rudy. Uh, he did so good high score in his uh, training that he was given uh, some free time to come home and help recruit other uh, kids. And he wound up recruiting his cousin, Robert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh so that's how that went. Okay. Yeah. He graduated second in his class. Oh, that was my IT. No, so after... Um... It's, I think it's after AIT or basic. I forget which one, but there's a little program. I forget. Basically, you just come back and it's like you get to rec you pretty much just help out the recruiters. Like, hey, you know, this is what. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was right after basic. Yeah, you're so a recruiter's is, aid, right? But they're talking about yeah. it later. So yeah, so you come back from training. So you got a little taste, tiny, tiny taste of what the army is. So you know, it helped give in to other people. So I just went to schools at the recruiters and helped them out. You know, they needed if they needed like a someone extra hand, I'll go help them out. And that was it for like two weeks. Then I went to AIT where I learned how to do welding and machining. And that, that's when I got second in my class. Cause I didn't even, tr I mean, I tried my best and I always, I took a lot of machining classes. Like I took automotive, uh, metal shop, wood shop and all in high school, just cause I like working my hands. You gotta find out what you gotta do. So, so you, when you came back as the recruiter's aide uh, or the assistant, you, um, how did it work out where what happened I, i'm trying to visualize you and your your cousin talking oh. about getting them into the, the army that's not how it went on at all so i <laughs> went so i went back home and he's like oh just me and the recruiters are talking just like casually and it's like yeah it's like oh do you like do you know like do you know anyone that like you want like would want to join and i'm like yeah um uh, my cousin so my cousin like tried to join the the Marines and you know they kind of pushed him off or whatever and then I think he tried to join the army too I forget I wish he was here like unless he's like watching yeah. it. let's mention where is he he's yeah. still he's, the, yeah, yeah no he's still in Pendleton no he's trying to get over here he's talking to sergeants but you know it's armies well maybe if they see the bro live broadcast <laughs> nah, I doubt that. <laughs> yeah like, I know that's the, the military he, he, yeah, he sent out those weapons so it's like he's his like bald yeah him. that's right but we, actually the person that signed him out whatever. yeah we talked about that too and he's uh he's all into uh the uh 240 he loves that 240 yeah, uh the, the machine armor yeah the armor yeah he's uh he's armor uh so that's an awesome thing so yeah we really miss him here i had a, a third chair set up for him so uh, in in honor of him he's it's still set up you know for uh even and we're running we ran late anyway so yeah, um we were supposed to start at two o'clock this afternoon with 1400 hours uh so we got pushed behind for my technical d uh, issues that we were having but we're still here uh so the, the, you and uh, Uncle Rudy, or your your grandfather. How often would you talk, or did you ask him for advice, or did he tell you stories, bounce you on his knee, and then let you know about army life or anything like that at some well, time? It's very different compared to now and then. Like, way different. Like in training and all that stuff, especially with the new weapon systems and everything. I don't know if we really actually we talked about just our times in training, but I don't think we ever maybe just some advice. You know, just you know just. Do, okay. do good, like, yeah. yeah. Keep your head under the bus. Like do all stuff. Like when they tell everyone telling me when I was gonna go to a basic training is like never.
like do well but like don't really stand out you know don't make you know, like you know if you just get through the training you'll be all right and then like literally the second week you're like uh casas and it was like yes drill sergeant it was like you're gonna go you're being charged a second squad and like shit <laughs> oh they and put I you in like, squad leader. yeah <laughs> I, but thankfully i never i was never fired from my job it was actually really easy a lot of people got fired and it's like i was me and some other person we, we didn't get fired and that was it and you never had uh, any uh rotc training or anything no. or in school no the only thing i really asked was um one of my i had a buddy i forget his name now some some kid in school i just asked him how do you do the pivot maneuvers with your feet and that was it and that's really it that's but, a... <laughs> yeah so you 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 learned the wait a minute what are, what's going on here i'm trying to where's where's my microphone uh, my mic I think I'm pushing the buttons too much. I'm putting mute all the time, and then now it's. <laughs> I know I keep hitting mute, and now it's all right. No, that's. Uh, no, I no. hear you. I hear you. In the yeah, mic. yeah, yeah. That's that's. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, look at that. I, I'm not even. All right. So I can't hear myself, but um, anyway, so uh, but. just learning the pivot is a very important thing. Uh, I always teach my naval cadets uh, heel and toe. You know, if you're going to pivot to the right, you want your left heel and your right toe or, or vice versa, you know. So it's a, it, it's a, not an easy thing to do. Uh, people might hear it as it's simple, but it's really not. So carry, you could carry on again. Uh, oh, that's pretty much it. Just to summarize, like, I went to basic training, and then after I came back, I did that two-week program. I helped out my cousin Bob. I told the recruiters about him in this little situation. And luckily, you know, they actually went out to him and then they recruited him. So he's in there. So, you know, I always talk, uh, always talk, uh, can, we, uh, can, I, can, I, can we say like crap? Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I talk crap <laughs> about my cousins yeah. and everything, but it's, it's all good. It's fun. But yeah, no, like he's in. And after that, then I went to, the, did my training for my AI, my job, actual job. And that's where I'll leave off right there. Just now I'll talk about where I went later. Okay. Because we'll get back to. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get you back to uh, Uncle Rudy here. Well, thank you for that, uh, Cousin Rudy the Third or Junior and all that good stuff. That's just Rudy. Yeah, there, just I, Rudy. little did I knew there was going to be a, a whirlwind of names that uh, I had to figure out at some point or another. Yeah. Uh, but to keep it simple, it's Rudy one, two, and three, or one, th two, I'm just, three. I'm just little Is Rudy. That a joke? Um. Oh, yeah, because I had asked if Ricky was still on because I didn't see his name flowing up through my my comment section, but he, he was still on. He goes, I'm still here. Uh, he said, ask Rudy about the baby he bought and paid for in 1951. <laughs> what? So is that what Rudy... The third or Rudy Senior number oh, one. That's 1941. That's pretty old. I that with him because I was thinking, why is he putting that? Yeah. yeah so, so do you know anything about that, or is that something that like it's a joke? Yeah. No. No. It's not a joke. But uh, uh, I don't think I want to comment on that. Okay. It's, yeah. It's, uh, it's a family matter. Okay. You know how funny Rick could be sometimes. Yeah, he could yeah. be. be sorry, of, sorry, Rick. <laughs> we had a left field there, man. Uh, but uh, there's been a lot of people saying hello uh, to to you, Theo. You know that are in the audience and um uh, i'm gonna just scroll through a little bit uh my mom's on here your sister's watching uh corey's watching uh shorty estrada we want to say hello to you for coming into the keith allen show audience lydia macias uh is here in the keith allen show audience as well martha rivera is back with us uh okay i got kicked out but i'm back thank you very much for coming back uh elizabeth espin uh, good afternoon, Lieutenant Silva. Saludos aquí con Cadet Razo. Uh, she's the mother uh, of one of my naval cadets. Uh, he is. Uh, she's on there, and they're watching us here. Uh, so hello, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for joining us and taking a listen to uh, my uncle Rudy, a, combat, a Korean combat veteran and Purple Heart recipient, and my cousin uh, Rudy. Uh, Das is the third over here. Rudy, Rudy, I, I, Rudy. A lot of Rudys. Let's say the Rudys. <laughs> One of the Rudys uh, is here with us. Uh, this documentary is a legacy. Thank you. So I'm just reading a few comments so you get to know what, what progress we're going on here. People are saying, wow, wow, that's amazing. Um, uh, Mom says hi. Okay, so I think I'm caught up there, but except for, yeah. Okay, so we're all caught up right there. So now... Uh, let's get back to uh, some of the questions uh, that we got uh, 
uh, for you, Uncle Rudy. And let's talk about uh, the time. Uh, where, let's get back to when you said that you went to recruiter's office and they said, no, you're too skinny and lanky and all that kind of stuff. And you persisted from there. So what, what came next? Uh, went to uh, Army recruiting office right after Christmas of 48 and uh, I enlisted in the Army. They accepted me right away. And um, <clears throat> after that, um, I went to Fort Ord and spent four months of basic training. Uh, and uh, I had volunteered for the 11th Airborne in Camp Campbell, Kentucky, which is Fort Campbell now. And uh, uh, when I got my orders, it says uh, Far East Command uh, duty and uh, asked them, you know, I thought I was going to the Airborne. And they said, well, we got an airborne unit in Japan. It was the 187 uh, of the 11th Airborne Division. So I said, well, okay. So there was uh, two, two, several of us that went. Uh, when I got to Japan in May of 49, uh, I was separated from my buddies and uh, I was the only one that was sent up north to uh, Sendai first, which was uh, one of the bases uh, that was 11 there born. And then from then on, I went on to uh, Hachinoi, Japan. That was my final destination. But the thing was that uh, the 11th Airborne, uh, the 187 was coming home to uh, Camp Campbell. And the uh, 7th Division was in South Korea right after the war and they were moved to replace the 11th Airborne. So I didn't get to do any jumping or any training Airborne. I became infantry. As you can see here, 7th Infantry Division. Can you hold the hat up for me so we can see it, Uncle? There you go. 7th yeah. Infantry Division. Yeah, I was, uh, I was in the 32nd Infantry Regiment. And uh, uh, after, um, I was there a year and a half. And uh, Japan had four infantry divisions. Uh, they had the 24th in the south, the 25th, and the 1st Cavalry around Tokyo, Yokohama, and the 7th Division took up the northern part of Japan and Hokkaido. So when the Korean War started, uh, one of our uh, battalions of the 32nd was uh, shipped to uh, Camp McGill in Yokosuka to uh, and participate in amphibious training with the 5th Marine Amphibious Brigade in Camp McGill. Well, there uh, we were in our second week of training when we heard that the North Koreans had invaded South Korea. Uh, all of the outfits and units that were there in training with us from the 24th, 25th, and 1st Cavalry uh, were shipped out right away. We were sent back to our base in northern Japan, and we waited there until uh, uh, the late part of July. And then we were sent down south to uh, Mount Fujiyama. And uh, they gave us 150 South Koreans. Okay. No, I was going to say, uh, can you do me a favor? Yeah, because somehow I hear a tapping of the mic. Uh, yeah, there you go. So, yeah, there you go. Click. Yeah, because I hear you hitting the mic with the, okay. with the cable or something. Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah, see your mic? Yeah, if you can help him get the, sort of move that cable out of his oh. headphone cable. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. Yeah, I just kept hearing tapping and tapping, and I didn't want it to keep interfering. Okay. Okay. There you go. That 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 should hopefully that'll work. Yeah. That was like water or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Go, sorry so, about that. So uh, we trained in Mount Fujiyama, and they gave us uh, 150 South Korean volunteers uh, to uh, for us to train. Uh, we were there until the late part of August, and uh, then we were shipped down to um, uh, Yokohama Bay, and we did an amphibious run into Camp McGill, uh, and uh, then we went back on the ship. And when we got back on the ship, uh, we changed, we showered, and we uh, uh, ate, then they gathered us in the main lobby, and they had a big old sign of uh, a map of uh, Korea with a big arrow paint pointing to Incheon. And they said, this is it. So 
we landed on uh, September the 16th. Uh, the, uh, one of the regiments of the 1st Marine Division landed in Womido uh, on, the, on the 15th. And uh, the, uh, the other two regiments and uh, the 7th Division landed the following day on the 16th. And we pushed towards Sewell, Kimpo, Sewell, all that. Uh, and we got as far as Seoul, <clears throat> uh, the capital of South Korea. Let me interject a little bit once more. I'm sorry for always interrupting you, but how old were you at this time? Or how young? Uh, I was 18. Okay, going into uh, this, uh, this conflict at 18 years old uh, or 18 years young. young. Um, when you were, during this time that you were doing the, uh, all this uh, process, did you connect with anybody? Did you have any like uh, close friends or that you became, you befriended or uh, did you have a group of people you hung out with or any, or were you just a loner? No, uh, when I first got to uh, the third Hachinoe, you know, I didn't know anybody. And um, then I found out uh, an old friend from um, El Paso, Texas. His cousin was part of the uh, neighborhood, the Macy neighborhood. And uh, his name was Fernando Sinus. He was from El Paso, Texas. They called him Banana. <laughs> so he came up to me and he says, uh, I know you. So yeah, I said, yeah, you know, so we became friends. And then later on, I found another friend uh, that uh, grew up uh, at, uh, in White Fence on Bernal. And uh, uh, we talked about this before, you know, he was the brother of your comadre, your sister, your mom's comadre. Uh, and, oh, Sadie. Uh, yeah, uh, Sadie. And er, uh, Ernie, okay. Yeah, he was uh, uh, G Gilbert Herrera. They went by Tito, even in the, in the service and the company, they used to call him Tito. Uh, anyway, I uh, met him there. And then uh, there was another one. Uh, we became real good friends. Uh, uh, his name was, uh, he was a Greek, uh, Gus, Gust Gustus Gustamolis from Pennsylvania, and uh, I still keep in touch with him, and uh, he... Who is this that you keep in touch with him? I, I didn't catch that. Uh, Gus, he goes by the name of Gus now. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, those are the three that uh, uh, that I met there. Uh, Fernando Sainz, uh, he, was, uh, he was one of the first volunteers to go to Korea. <clears throat> when the, when the Korean War broke out, the 24th Division was the first division that was sent in to Korea <clears throat> to fight the uh, North Koreans. <clears throat> you know what I miss, what I missed out is that we have uh, uh, shadow boxes, which I sh I wish I could have I could have had uh, I was supposed to have my third camera aimed at that shadow box of yours. Uh, I failed to set that up, but what I would do. Uh, post uh, Keith Allen show is uh, take some video footage of it and then insert it into the uh, the footage of our live feed so that people could see it after the fact. Um, you, uh, but, you want uh, my son to take it down and put it. Uh, oh, is it is it possible to yeah, do that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're going to have uh, Rudy the second here uh, or Rudy. I'm just going to say Rudy's again. Uh, he's going to get in there for us and try to bring that over. And, and it's my fail. It's uh, my fault for not getting it uh, set up with the camera. Um, we were running so far behind that I decided, uh, you know, uh, we'll just wait on that. So he's gonna bring it down for us here. And we're gonna take a look at it. We're gonna put it here. Let me see if I can put it on this camera. There you go. I put it on the wide camera. Uh, let me see if I put it on the close up. if it catches it at all. No, okay, so that's fine right there. Um, you know, if you could, if you could tweak this uh, to where the mic is going toward you, uh, cousin Rudy. Yeah, uh, see this microphone. Yeah, yeah. Bend it. Yeah, there you go. Bend it out so that it could. Um, yeah. So there it is. There's uh, the shadow box. Now, who put this together for? Do you put it together? No, somebody put it together for you. But yeah, you my, added to my it. My stepdaughter put it together, Bridget. Okay. And, uh, and then I wanted to, to uh, go. I wanted to ask you to go over some of these things. And I'm sorry for interrupting you again on your story, uh, <laughs> but I feel we're gonna we'll get we'll still get back to that story. Uh, yeah. But I want them to see, uh, you know, some of the accolades that you uh, had to actually fight for to or or stay on top of 
just to uh, get awarded some of these medals that you were you were due. So uh, maybe you can explain to us from uh, from the top down uh, what medals you received there. Well, can I get up and point to them? Yeah, yeah, you sure can. Yeah. There you go. All righty. Started with this one here. That's a good conduct. Okay. Right, so you got the good conduct medal there. The purple heart. And the purple heart, of course. Uh, National defense. National defense. Uh, 50th anniversary of the Korean War. 15th anniversary of the Korean War. Korean service medal. Korean service medal. Yeah, you know what? Um, wait, give me a second. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Continue, Theo. I'm sorry. United Nations service medal. United Nations service medal. And. Uh, this is a Korean unit citation. Korean unit citation. Korean presidential unit citation. Okay. Occupation of Japan. My uh, combat, combat infantry badge. Uh, and these four patches are the outfits that I was stationed with. I started my basic training with the 4th Infantry Division, the 4th Clover. When I went to Japan, I was in the 7th Division and Korea. When I came home, uh, they sent me to Fort MacArthur, the uh, 370th boat, boat and shore engineers, and that's the seahorse. This outfit was deployed to Panama, and they couldn't take me because I only had five months left, and they wanted me to re-enlist to be their interpreter. Uh, so I said no. So they sent me to uh, Camp Cook, the uh, 303rd Signal Service Battalion. And that's that patch right there. This outfit was sent to uh, Las Vegas for uh, an atomic bio experiment with the troops on the ground. While we were loading to go to uh, uh, Las Vegas, I got sick from a gunshot wound that I received in a shrapnel in Korea. So they sent me back to Denver, Colorado, where I had spent five months recuperating. So I got to miss, I missed out on that, uh, uh, on that experiment. And it's a good thing that I did, because yeah. uh, uh, after I got out of the service, I saw on TV whether some of my members of the outfit complaining they had cancer. So I was glad for that. And, uh, Not for um, the cancer part, but the participate yeah 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 so that was a, that was a, uh, a good uh, miss yeah so when I got out of the service I didn't get none of this uh, it wasn't until 2005 when I applied for my medals and my compensation and I got I got seven medals presented to me here in Pico Rivera at the senior center with 11 other military members and deceased members, uh, their parents received uh, medals. And it wasn't until 2013 that I received my compensation, 100%. I still have shrapnel in my, my lungs, my chest. Well, that's right, because we, we, uh, we haven't talked about that yet, uh, about your injuries. Uh, we'll be getting to that pretty soon, all right? What's this? What's the seahorse uh, patch again? Huh? Oh, seahorse? The patch for the seahorse? Oh, that was the 370th Boat and Shore Regiment. Yeah. Engineers. Was it? Um, oh, my. my uh, one of my first sergeant in Korea before he left. Uh, he was part of that. My buddy, uh, Brian, he was uh, he's like, he asked him about that. He was like, he's like, first sergeant, why do you have that seahorse? I was like, it's not a seahorse, it's a dragon. Mm. And I thought, <laughs> like, no, no. It's like, that's always remember that for. <laughs> Thank you, Rudy. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that down. Uh, all right. So, yeah, so he has a nice, and I, I know my uncle wants to extend that out to a more horizontal framework uh, as opposed to it being vertical like that. Uh, but an awesome background right there. Uh, and, and he had to work on getting uh, a lot of the medals that were due to him. And he finally did that, uh, which is uh, uh, what, you know, the end result is here in the shadow box.
Uh, once again, we'd like to thank everybody here for joining us here on the live broadcast of the Keith Allen Show, a special edition uh, pre-Veterans uh, uh, Day uh, for the 11th of November of 2020. Uh, what other pictures? Oh, yeah, there's a special picture here that uh, my cousin Rudy uh, mentioned to me that, uh, where was this that you, you took a picture of, uh, or you sent it to someone? Well, that I, I posted that on Is it, it's in Channel 5 because they're doing a... a a Veterans Day uh, celebration. So if you go on Channel Five, uh, their their main page, you can actually download a veterans or currently serving uh, military per personnel picture, and you put us. You could put your your thank yous oh, or a, a, a small comment on there. And if you go on there, you can see a lot of people, a lot of pictures that are uh, people that are posted. Uh, there were World War II veterans and Vietnam veterans and, and so forth. And it's sort of like when you go, when I go to the market, sometimes I go to, to certain markets, you'll see a wall of, of heroes and you'll see a lot of pictures uh, of the veterans or serving members there in some of the markets. Uh, that's what it reminded me of when you mentioned it's like a wall of heroes. Or, yeah, and because uh, of this whole COVID thing, they're not going to have these celebrations. So what they're doing is during their broadcast and when they go to commercial... Can you, oh. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have him sit down because he's out of frame. <laughs> so we just hear the voice, but no face. Yeah, there you go. If you just scoot yourself in, oh, there you go. So there you go. So when they go to commercial, um, it comes up in this little segment and it shows that picture. Oh, I see. oh, okay. They go to a commercial and they show yeah, it. So, so uh, this is happening on Channel 5, the KTLA. Wow. Okay. So y'all now, do you think this running through the the day, the week, or until Veterans they Day? They through, through Veterans through the twentieth, I believe. Oh, okay. That's so then great. And you'll be able to see this particular picture that you yeah, you I, sent I in. I posted this picture. I posted the one of my son, and then the one of my nephew Robert. Oh, okay. So I got to look into that. I have to change it to that channel five so I can check those pictures yeah, yeah, out. And, then, and you know, <laughs> I'm not getting any endorsement or anything, but that's what I watched, and I said, well, you know, this is a good way of. of saying thank you and oh, most definitely hold that picture up a little bit higher so i want to take a look at it because i the microphone yeah there you go hold it up uh, up in the air there you go a little higher uh, you want to do that camera it's oh yeah let me see let me switch, switch over to the oh there you go <laughs> there you go see i have that i have to be uh there you go wow look at that yeah now that that's the one you said Uncle you were Rudy. in uh, that that was uh, great that, thank you oh, wait, wait a minute I, I want to talk about the boots there was a story about those boots right uncle yeah they were yeah. airborne airborne boots and uh boots. the guys from uh, the airborne that uh stayed there they had re-enlisted they bought me a pair of boots those boots yeah those are the real the real uh paratrooper boots and those are the Cor Corcoran, or Corcoran. Yeah, they were uh, from Corcoran. Jump boots. <laughs> yeah. it, because you were supposed to be, you you thought you were going to be in the Airborne because yeah. you wanted the Airborne. And then they sent you over to Japan, uh, but you still got your Airborne boots. Yeah. That is very nice. Uh, yeah, because I remember that picture that you had mentioned, uh, something Rick, about that. So, Rick, so that, uh, they, Rick, Rick, oh. Uh, oh. Keith. Oh, there you <laughs> Time out. Okay, so yeah, we're going to take a, a short little break, and uh, we're going to be back again, so don't go away. Uh, we'll, we'll be coming back shortly, okay? So stand by uh, for the, the part three of the Keith Allen Show going live. Okay, uh, we'll be right back.
story about tortilla flats. A book, it says, don't spit on my corner. He became a probation officer. He was a uh, World War II veteran, Mar uh, Marine. He was in my writing class. So, in, in, yeah, who is this person you're, you're, you're mentioning? Uh, huh? Who is this person again? Mike Duran. Oh, oh Mike Duran. It sounds like a movie name, Mr. Yeah, Mike he Duran. Grew up in, the, in the, the gully. He knew my uncles and my grandparents. Yeah. Duran. Well, like I said, sometimes there's some uh, some of the people that are watching that are from that area, that could probably definitely relate to that. Uh, the, some of the people. That's why I'm hoping uh, some of them uh, can hear your story and, and relate to it, know it. You remember the your ad, the address. Uh, 624, I think, uh, 620, 240. 240? No, 440. Four, oh, 440. That's where my, my grandma lived. That was the, the address. 240 or 440? No, 440. 440. 440. That was, 440 how funny. Bernal. I don't know why I remember a 240. Probably Sadie. Sadie probably. Yeah. Either that, I knew she had a phone number forever. That is like, yeah. I'm like, why wouldn't they give her... A free phone service for having it for like 50 years phone service you know yeah. paying a phone call uh, for her phone service for all those years uh, i was always in awe of that you know so the many years that, the thing that I couldn't get over with is going up to her house everything you're looking down <laughs> Remember the steep? Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the stairs. We yeah. used to, as a kid, it was not too bad for us because uh, we enjoyed. Yeah, big steps, you know, going up, you know. Yeah, uh, you know, um, when we were playing in the back, they had that uh, chain link fence back there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to climb up on it um, to get on the tree that was right next to it. I climbed up on the tree, and Corey, Archie Martin were there, and uh, I was barefooted. Uh, which was not a good thing, but I was climbing up the tree and I was coming down the tree and I was like trying to hang on because I was slipping and I slipped down onto the, the chain link fence, little forks, the, the little oh, thing the, sticking. The wires. Yeah, and, I, and my feet got stuck and both both feet got stuck in those pins, you know, the things on the chain link fence right. and Archie and them were trying to pull my feet out of those things. So I some harsh memories of but but you know as a kid you know yeah. you're just all over the place just not even uh, thinking of the consequences sometimes of the the pain you're going to suffer uh if you don't know better but we're back live now okay uh and we're going to get back into this so welcome back thank you all for sticking around here on the keith allen show i'm going to go ahead and read some of the comments and recognize sadie was five four five three there's uh ricky uh said her address was four five three south bernal so he remember because those were his godparents. So yeah. So he re he remembers that. Uh, let me see. Let me get some of the some of the uh, comments here. This is so interesting. Uh, Lydia Macia says, um, uh, Bonita says, uh, very interesting. Always good to know. Amazing. Uh, uh, is this live? Yes, it is. Yolanda Nieto. We are live now. We took a little break and we're back now. We are back live. Ermalinda is nice special stories show. Thank you very much. Uh, and then we carry on here just a little bit more. Uh, we have them giving some thumbs up. Uh, we love this. Uh, we love it. Uh, I love to hear stories like this because my brother was in the service. Uh, what branch of service, Yolanda, was he in? Do you remember? Uh, and what error? Uh, that's okay, Keith. Uh, I'm really glad I caught it live. Well, thank you. Uh, Shorty Estrada says, you're very welcome, my beautiful. Oh, that's Kathy and her talking. Uh, thumbs up for John D. Chava. Oh, John G. Chavaria, that's your son. <laughs> He's giving a thumbs up with fire on it. <laughs> uh, Debbie Arajo. Uh, that sounds familiar, that last name. My niece. Oh, there you go. Okay, so she says, Hi, Uncle Rudy. <laughs> She's watching. Uh, Brianna Isabel Munoz. Uh, oh, Auntie. Uh Auntie. Yeah, that's my uh, my nephew's uh, daughter. Yeah, she says Auntie Josie and Rene, Rene, Rene are watching here. Shout out to Uncle Rudy. Yeah. Well, shout out to uh, all of you there at, at your your home. Uh, Debbie Arajo, looking good, Theo. Uh, uh. The heart <laughs> and the thumbs up. Uh, Yolanda Nieto, this is super nice. 
Uh, Rick Cows, oh, she he mentioned again that uh, Sadie's address was 453 South Bernal. Uh, Kathy put up our phone number. So, uh, yeah, just a reminder, which I didn't mention before, is that uh, we have a live phone call in. If you want to ask or, or just give a shout out to Uncle Rudy or Cousin Rudy uh, anytime, Kathy put up the phone number there in the comment section, which is area code 626-425-6906. This is the Keith Allen Show dedicated line, so uh, you call in to us anytime if you want to ask a question or give a comment or a shout out. Uh, once again, that number 626-425-6906, and you can find it in the comment section. Just scroll back and you'll find it or scroll forward. Debbie Araujo, love your story, Steel. All right, so it's it, and the wine helps to relax uh, the atmosphere. So, yeah, uh, yeah and cousin Rudy had uh, some relaxing material with him earlier today, so <laughs> he's chillaxing right now. He's uh, just uh, waiting for his turn. Uh, matter of fact, here's the where I I didn't even put him. Ooh, what happened to my? Oh, okay, I didn't switch cameras. There we go. All right, there's uh, cousin Rudy right there. I didn't have him on the on the the frame there, so there he is. So he's still with us, and thank you once again for joining us. So let's uh, pretty soon um, we're gonna get really into the nitty gritty of uh, hearing the the intense stories from Uncle Rudy and his time uh, during the Korean uh, conflict and uh, his time being wounded and all. And we're gonna hear that story pretty soon. Uh, but I, uh, briefly, I want to get into asking uh, cousin Rudy over here on my left. Uh, about his MOS that you had in the, the United States Army and uh, what was it that you did uh, during your time there in active service? Oh, yes, yeah, you go ahead and talk about this way. We'll get into that before we get into the nitty gritty uh, yummy story for Uncle Rudy and what he went through in his combat tour. Oh, well, my MOS, it just means uh, your main military occupation, what you do is just, I was just a 91 Echo, which is a welder and a machinist and so basically i would just fabricate or repair anything really that they needed like for steel work or anything like aluminum so that's pretty much my job i've been to a lot of units though i've been to my first unit was in virginia and fort eustis and i was uh i was part of a, a boat unit it was for like landing craft so like it was for you know, like pretty much it was a evolution of the the Higgins boats, are they, what are they called? The LCMs? Uh, what's what we use now? Landing, uh, landing, landing vehicles. Yeah, that's the, the Higgins boats from like World War II, and then they got evolved to like, so but the ones we had at that time when I was over there was the ones they used in Vietnam. And, uh, they have, they probably carry about like 60 people, and then that's what, that's probably my first unit. Um, it was small, it's really small. I think it was like 90 people at most. I noticed you had a coin that you're playing with right there. What is that for? Oh, this is I'm playing with a coin right now. Just, <laughs> but I seen there's is there significance to that or oh, is no, it like a challenge coin? No, no. Because I know you you heard about challenge coins. You know yeah, about challenge coins. I, I have a couple. Well, yeah. actually, I lost my first one I ever got. But do you know the story where what you're supposed to do with that challenge coin? No. No. Okay. So like, if you ever go in the bar, like if you you drink a beer or if you drink cocktails or, or cranberry juice like i do uh and you're sitting at a bar and uh somebody slaps down a challenge coin and you don't have one you're the one paying for the drinks that's supposed to, that's how that works you know nah, never so that. never have it to you well you're still a young stud there so you you haven't had that experience but maybe someday down in your yes you might want to keep one handy somewhere but uh is that was that from the army or is that nah, just, nah, just uh i got it from i was just uh went somewhere after work yeah that's lunch. right and then you had some kind of a classic toy model there that we were talking about earlier yeah that, I was just empty you said it was pretty stuff. big thing right now no it's not that big no, just yeah, for you so, though. Yeah, it's for me. Oh, okay. I thought it was something we could talk about and get into. And nah, it's all about hmm? the veterans thing. It's mostly about him. So really, I'm just more about that. I'll just <laughs> well, throw in my I thought there was. I, I thought there was a tie-in to that, to like the, you know, like something that calms you down after a service time or, um, something that occupies your your mind and your time. Uh, uh, matter of fact, talking about that kind of stuff, uh, PTSD was a big thing and, and it's still around. So. Uh, we'll probably get into a little bit of that too, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and you know, those of us that might know uh, another that is suffering with that or dealing with that, I do know uh, the previous commanding officer that was in my place before I took over the unit. He, um, along with some other uh, people, uh, had created or started uh, this uh, uh, this whole thing for PS PTSD. 
Uh, and, you know, I got into starting to say it, and then now I'm drawing a blank. Uh, uh, it's the Oasis, uh, but I can't remember. It was Arizona or New Mexico. But they created this environment, which is out in the wilderness, and they have brand new uh, buildings they're building out there. They're doing all this stuff for those that are, that are having issues with it or dealing with it where they can go. So uh, that's a unique thing. But uh, at some point, I'll look that up again and po post it in the links uh, post uh, Keith Allen show. Uh, but we're going to get back to it. And yeah, and um, uh, Cousin Rudy's uh, right. We're going to get back on the track and talk about... Um, the tour of duty uh, once again with my uncle Rudy back in the 50s out in the Korean conflict. And I keep saying conflict because that's the way I heard it when I was growing up, the Korean conflict. It's probably because they didn't really walk it, want to recognize it as a war uh, or, or something to that effect. Uh, but that's uh, just like the Vietnam. They called it a, a police action. Uh, but I guess many of those that were there didn't feel like it was a it felt like a war to them. I mean, if you're shooting at somebody and shooting back, people are dying and getting hurt. You know, that to me is like a war, not not necessarily such a, a thing as a police action or or a conflict. Uh, it's a war uh, to me, shooting weapons back and forth each other and uh, taking uh, body counts like that is a war to me. Uh, so let me uh, get back to some of the comments really quick, and then we're going to get into your completion of the, uh, your story, Uncle Rudy. Okay. Uh, Debbie Arajo, uh, love your story still. Uh, love this show. Uh, Lydia Macias, <clears throat> Yolanda Nieto, I love your uncle's story, his medals too. All right, cool. So we're all caught up with that. So that, now let's skip back to the, the back to Korea. You were now you were in South Korea at this time uh, during the 50s when you arrived and um, and you were in. The, I want to hear what unit you were in and what it was like when you first arrived there and what was happening at the time when you first arrived there at Korea. When the when the Korean War started, um, like I said, you know, the, Japan, we have four infantry divisions and uh, but they were undermanned. They weren't fully uh, uh, manned, you know, up to um, strength. So the 24th was the closest division to South Korea. And uh, they, they asked for volunteers from the other three divisions. And uh, when it got to my division, uh, I volunteered to go as a, a replacement with the 24th division. And uh, when my uh, platoon sergeant saw my name, he pulled me to a side and he told me, he says, uh, you don't want to go with a lot of strangers, you know. Eventually, we're all going, so would you rather go with uh, strangers you don't know or uh, men that you know with? So uh, he made me realize that he had a point, so we stayed. Uh, and. Uh, like I said here before, we went to training in Mount Fujiyama. Uh, that's way up there in the uh, that volcano that they have in uh, in Yokohama, and uh, we trained South Korean uh, um, uh, volunteers. They weren't part of the uh, uh, Rock Division, the Republic of Korea divisions, and. Um, we, after all this training, we did a, a dry run, amphibious training, I mean amphibious uh, landing into um, Camp McGill. And uh, once we came back on a ship, they told us, you know, where we were going. So uh, uh, we were out in sea for um, several, a couple of weeks, I think. And uh, we even ran into a typhoon, and uh, it was hell. Uh, um, you know, we had to tie everything down, and uh, finally, uh, when everything settled down, we went into uh, uh, the northern part of Korea, towards Incheon. Uh, when we got to Incheon, uh, we were coming in. Excuse me, Uncle. I'm yeah. sorry. Here I go again, cutting you off. I'm so sorry. We have a phone call, so let's check out to see who's calling us. Okay. Okay, so let's stand by and see who's here. Hello, you're on the Keith Allen Show. Who's calling? Hello, you're live on the Keith Allen Show. Who's calling? I can't hear you. Anybody speaking? <laughs> Can you hear anything on you? You know, huh? No. I don't hear anything. Hello, you're on the Keith Allen Show. 
Anybody? Oh, I have the wrong. Oh, okay, go ahead. I had the wrong volume knob up. <laughs> oh my. Okay, so carry on, Uncle. I'm sorry. Okay. Um. Uh, when, uh, like I said, you know, uh, one of one of the uh, regiments of the First Marine Division went in first. Uh, they um, they went into a uh, Walmido Island, which is a line island that protrudes out into uh, uh, the uh, Strait of. Uh, of uh, South Korea, and uh, the following day on the 16th, we landed uh, with the uh, rest of the Marines Division, and uh, we fought all the way into uh, Seoul. In Seoul, the the uh, Marines took the, they did the ground the city fighting, and we took uh, the high ground, uh, which is a. Uh, uh, a hill that's, um, well, it's more like a mountain uh, overlooking Seoul. We crossed the uh, the Han River into Seoul after we bombarded it uh, the previous night, uh, and uh, we moved in there. And we had a pause, uh, uh, we're halfway up the, the hill or the mountain, and um, uh, we took out our uh, sea rations to uh, to snack on them, you know, and um, um, I came into a scene where uh, it really, uh, it it really uh, shook my mind. I saw these kids coming out of their bombed out houses and all that, and uh, some of them were patched up where they got hurt, and uh, they were standing around us, you know, as we were trying to get a snack or something from our sea rations. And uh, I felt sorry for them. So I took out, uh, uh, we had, uh, in our sea rations, we had a chocolate hard as a rock. <laughs> and uh, I asked uh, kids in, in Japanese, because uh, I didn't, uh, well, the Koreans knew Japanese because they were under occupation for a long time. And uh, I asked them for water, you know, misu. So they went and got me some hot water, so. I made them some chocolate. I broke up the chocolate uh, bar disc, and I gave them to them. You know, then I took out the biscuit, uh, also hard as a rock, but it was fortified with a lot of vitamins and nutrition. And uh, I felt sorry for them, you know. And uh, I couldn't, I couldn't leave. Once we got orders to move on, I gave them all my my sea rations because I knew I would where I would be getting my next meal. And uh, so did the other guys that were with me. You know, they gave they gave them their their sea rations. Uh, that was one incident. Uh, and uh, let, we, uh, let me. I'm sorry. I want to go back a little bit and ask you about the uh, uh, tap into misu, because uh, there was at one time I was working at a Japanese steakhouse, mm -hmm. and there was misu soup that we have to serve to the people every time for like a derv, uh -huh. uh, or just like a pre meal. But I never understood what that meant, misu soup. You know, uh, I used to put some tofu. Sometimes they said I don't want tofu, but just seaweed. Sometimes I put tofu, uh, seaweed, but no tofu, or, or vice versa, mm -hmm. and uh, onions, green onions. Uh, so that's the way we used to mix it. Uh, but I never understood. So it means water. Yeah, misu is water. Imagine that. So I was serving them water, but there was a it was a soup, but they yeah. called it water. I'm yeah. going to serve you some water. Oh, yeah. okay. Here comes a phone call again. Let's see if we get it right this time, Theo. Okay. All right. Hello. You're live on the Keith Allen Show. Uh, this is Josie, Rudy, Rudy's oh, sister. Yeah. And I just want to tell him to give a shout out to my husband, David Louis Munoz, that was killed in Vietnam in 1969. That's right. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's right. So David Munoz. Uh, yeah, it, uh, that was back in '69 uh, when you. when you found no, out no. that he was uh, missing in action, or yes, they, he was missing in action, and they just declared him what? dead. In Wait. That's 
Are you, are you? Yeah, and, and no, I found out that he was missing in action in 1969. Ten years later, they declared him dead. So, yeah, so that was back in 1970 when you... when you Yeah, 79 that they declared him dead, uh, killed in action, but they never found him. They never were able to find him. What branch of service was he in? Army, 82nd Airborne. I'm sorry, say it again. Army, 82nd Airborne. Me, He was a uh, 101st Airborne. 101st, yes. 100 I Airborne. It was 101st <laughs> Airborne, not the 82nd. Okay, it was 101st Airborne. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Well, we're sorry to hear that, uh, it, uh, you know, about David. And, you know, I, I know I couldn't I can't even fathom the, the, the years that you had to go through without knowing what happened to him. Or, or yes. did you get to hear from him at all? Be, did he write to you before they told you he was missing in yes. action? Or, so what was, the, yes. what was the last letter you remember getting from David? Oh, I don't remember because mm -hmm. I remember him saying not to write because he had only been there. Uh, a few weeks, and he said, don't write because we're going to move out, but we don't know where we're going. So that's what we didn't do, because he went, he went in the last that I heard, heard from him. Uh, I, I okay. understand. It's, it's pretty hard for you, right? I mean, it's a, it's a tough, yeah, tough thing to you know, I, Yeah, if, if, you know, when I think about it i get very emotional because i never knew what happened to him you know i, I and that's the, that's the, the hard part not knowing yeah i know yeah i totally agree with you on that and just not you know like i said i couldn't even fathom that happening uh to me with a loved one that i i think yeah i'd come close to being stir crazy uh trying to yeah. act like i don't know anything or i gotta f stop thinking about it uh, but you know, it's something that will always be behind you in your mind. Uh, but yeah. I like to thank you for sharing that story with us, and we we definitely give a honorable shout out to uh, uh, your husband David Munoz, uh, senior. Okay. Is he or is he a senior no, or junior? David Louis, David Louis senior. Okay. David Louis Munoz senior. Got My that. son is David Louis Munoz. Hi, Dio. Hi, primo. <laughs> hey guys. Hi. All right. Thank you very much for calling in, and, and uh, right. we we uh, we appreciate you tuning in and taking a listen with us on the Keith Allen Show. Okay. Take care no, now. Rudy can, can continue. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Hey. Wait. 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 Before you leave, uh, you you, want, you, uh, you mind if I mention something about uh, David? No. Huh? I don't mind. No, I don't mind. That you know, remember you told me that uh, he might he was related to Abraham Lincoln. Uh huh. Huh? Yes, I need cousin. You what? Eighth cousin. Eighth cousin. He's like the yeah. eighth cousin. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, yeah. and uh, his brother resembled Abraham Lincoln. Remember, Penny? Um. No. Benny? Benny didn't resemble him. What? Benny didn't resemble him. David and Jet and Benny were twins. And he didn't resemble well, you know what maybe the shape of his face, yeah, it could be. But David was I mean Benny was more lighter and had freckles. Oh well who was the one that uh, was in that wedding that uh, you introduced me to? He told me that he was uh, eighty. Uh, Benny. Benny, yeah. That was Benny, uh huh. What? And it was David's wedding. It was Benny. Yeah, but uh, he re he was uh, he resembled uh, Abraham Lincoln when I told you. You know, look at he, he oh. looks uh, he looks like Abraham Lincoln. Oh, I didn't remember. I'm sorry. You know that old age is creeping up. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I know it's been creeping up for years now. Was that was that was that a joke or was that was it reality? 
<laughs> no, that was uh Was that for real? The yeah. Abraham Lincoln thing or Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was like an inside joke amongst both of you. <laughs> no, no. Uh David they, her husband Rudy's lost over here. <laughs> David her husband yeah. was uh half Anglo and uh, Mexican. Oh. His mom was uh the one related to Abraham Lincoln. Oh, yeah. I I see. Oh, yeah. wow. Well, that's a uh, that's a unique connection right there. But then again, uh, when you think back about uh, in those times, they, they were they were you know sharing themselves with a lot of different population, and uh, that's why we have so many genes in us uh, yeah. from back then, uh, you know, from the start of those early times. Yeah. But um, uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, uh, give us your name again. Yeah, that's Beanie. Beanie. Josie. 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 <laughs> so where'd you get Beanie from? I, we, 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 yeah, I, I named her Beanie. You know. yeah, yeah, what does that mean, I, Beanie? It was short for uh, Josephine. Oh, oh, Fiend, like Bean, okay. Bean, okay, Josephine. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, be, not Beanie. Not Beanie. Beanie. No. Uh, Beanie, Beanie <laughs> no. Yeah, in, Jos in junior high school, they used to call her Beanie. Beanie. <laughs> With a B. <laughs> oh, that sucks, man. That's yeah. that's that's well. You know, thank you for tuning in, um, yeah. Di and, and Primo. Uh, no, I appreciate. What happened to Rini? Rini. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when they were growing up, <coughs> you know, there was fourteen of us in the family, four boys and ten girls. It was Velia. Well, no, I mean, no. It was uh, it was uh, uh, your mom, Helen, Lilia, Velia. Uh, Becky, Pini, Rini, Mary, Stella, and Margie. And then there was a one more, uh, Christina. I never got to see her, mm -hmm. you know, she was still born. She died. Yeah. But then I found out about her when I was in a foxhole in Korea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Keith, your mom sent me a letter saying that uh, my mom was okay, but uh, the baby had died. Oh, and, uh, so, that's what you said. Man, so, well, that's, but, but we got a we got a lot of military family. You know, I mean, we have a lot of them. La, Lilia Macias says ours were Zapata soldier. Who? Z uh, Lilia Macias, uh, one of our audience members. Uh -huh. she, she says ours, our ours were Zapata oh. soldiers. <laughs> so I don't. Oh, so I said descendants of maybe Zapata. You know, and I guess. The, that era in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also uh, the Pancho Villa, right? There's yeah. Pancho Villa and Zapata. Yeah. So, oh, well, good to go. That's, yeah. you know, that's some, some anything else that you want to share with us or, or or talk with Uncle Rudy with and right or our cousin Rudy over here? Anything mm -hmm. you guys, but yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, a shout out uh, to your, your husband that was missing in action and ultimately um, uh, written down as uh, killed KIA. Uh, during the Vietnam War, um, which is a you know sad conflict as well as the Korean conflict and or war, um, but um, we recognize him and all the service members uh, coming up this 11th of November 2020. Uh, we uh, sincerely appreciate all of their sacrifices and uh, the duty of service. So thank you, for, thank you once again for your call. Uh, I, I want to I want to say to all my sisters, you know, stay safe, wear your mask. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 We, we do. Okay. We do. We do, Theo. Okay. Looking good. Looking good. Thank Looking you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Semper Fi, uh, Ricky says, shout out. Semper Fi. Yeah. Where, where's okay, the Ura? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Thank cousin you, David. Thank you, uh, uh, cousin Josie. Bye. Bye now. Okay. Bye. Don't hang up. I've still got some more. <laughs> they hung up already. <laughs> was, well, you got some more dirt, or no? I want to hear some dirt. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, there you go. That was a very nice conversation there. With uh, uh, see, and I'm confused with the Pini, the Josie thing, because uh, I think I always uh, remember her as uh, uh, Aunt Pini too. And I call her that all the time. Um, but then we also had a, I had an Aunt Rini, right? There was Aunt Rini yeah. and. Uh, was, so those two would always uh, throw me confused. I would call one Rini when she's Peeny, one Peeny, and she's not, she's Rini. Well, you know, the reason for, their, you know, those names is because uh, it was easy for me to rhyme them off, you know. 
like saying eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Eeny, reeny, meeny, miny. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Lydia Macia says, uh, Pancho Villa was related to me. Uh, my grandpa rode with him. Ah, oh, look oh, at that. Okay. That's De good. Yeah, you know, uh, when I was a, a young 11-year-old, my mother sent me to Mexico in a rancho in Pueblo Chileno, uh, in Durango, Mexico, and uh, my step-grandfather there showed me a cueva, a cave, where Pancho Villa or Zapata, one of them, and his riders went and stood in that cave, and they never touched it. They left it untouched, and there was money bags, uh, hay there for the horses, a fire pit, and a whole bunch of rocks set up for where they used to sit around the fire, and they used to escape to that cave, uh, per my grandfather that told me that my step grandfather at that time and i was pretty in awe about that i was like where are you taking me you know we were going to go hunt deer up in the mountains and uh he said uh, we're going to make a detour and show you something real quick something unique nobody really knows about but us here in this little pueblo because he used to ride through there and go to that cave and hide out so that was a pretty unique thing and a history thing that i remember back in that day at 11 12 years old uh so a little tidbit of information of my past uh, um, Debbie hey. Arahu says, wow, I never knew about Cristina. I thought my mom was the last one. No. That was Debbie Arahu. Um, Lydia Macias says, family ancestors are remarkable, amazing. Uh, so, yeah, so she didn't know about that, but now she does. Yeah. See, the power of media. You know? mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> it goes out there. So I, I'm sorry for uh, rudely interrupting you all the, all the time, Theo. I really want to get you uh, keep your flow going, but it's a bit hard sometimes when I'm getting a phone call and yeah. there's something we got to say. I, I did mention to you I was going to interject every so often with you, right. so I did give you a heads up, so it's not too much of a surprise. But let's get back to your story again. We're in Korea. Uh, you, you were... Um, getting prepared for your you know meeting your new your company your your platoon or you know uh what platoon or what company were you with again when you arrived there in korea i was in headquarters company second battalion 32nd infantry regiment 7th infantry division oh my god man, that's a long title and you still remember that like yeah. it's yesterday yeah you know when i was in japan <clears throat> uh when I first got to Japan, they put me in the F Company as an assistant machine gunner. But when I joined the Army, they go by your previous job that you had, and they give you an MOS for that job. My MOS was 066, and that was communications. So when I got to Japan, they found out, and they transferred me from F Company after two weeks. And they put me in headquarters company. In January 1950, I got uh, orders to go to school, cryptography school, in Hokkaido, in Sapporo, Japan. And I was there for three weeks, learning uh, how to uh, <clears throat> decipher and cipher messages. That was going to be my job. And while we were in training, when the Korean War was on, I got to use that uh, experience, that training. But when we got to Korea, I never got to use it. I was also, I was always called for extra duty, uh, a bodyguard or a lookout. Uh, and they were always assigning me hazardous positions. I never got to use my, uh, my converter, my uh, experience as a, as a, a cryptographer. So I don't know what happened to all my equipment once I got wounded. I wanted to ask you about uh, being here, you're talking about cryptography, cryptography and mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, uh, cryptography. And I, I, I just flashed back in my mind to cold talkers. Uh, was that similar to like what you were doing? Like you said, uh, it was in code, everything that you were learning yeah. to communicate with. Did you ever hear about cold talkers back oh, then? Oh yeah. No, 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 not back then. I didn't learn about it until after they made the movie. Okay, yeah, because the World War World War Two, they were they were active during World War Two. Yeah. So they did uh, Korea. Definitely, the Korean conflict or war was after that. Uh, mm -hmm. But you didn't hear anything about them during that time. No, that you... no. Wow. Oh. So do you do you think uh, at this time now that you know about them that that they just suppressed that and just forgot all about them like that? Yeah. Well, I don't mm -hmm. know uh, what happened, but. Um, uh, yeah, during the, uh, the Second World War, uh, they came up with the idea to confuse the Japanese because uh, they would 
uh, they would get into, they find out the codes of the Americans and find out, you know, what they were doing. But uh, when the Navajos were using their language uh, to communicate, uh, the Japanese couldn't break their codes. They couldn't understand what they were talking about. Yeah, I would have thought, if I didn't know any better, I would have yeah. thought that would encourage you to, to get into that field, but then you were just assigned that field. Yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't because you saw cold talkers back then, mm -hmm. uh, but it was just because they assigned you. You were actually wanting to be airborne, like you say, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, uh, so, okay, I'm sorry. So you continue on and... Yeah, and well, before before I joined the, Air, uh, the Army, my last job was working for uh, Western Union, the telegraph company working out of the Times building on first and uh, between uh, Spring and Broadway. And uh, I was delivering telegrams all over LA. And uh, that's what they went for by in giving me my MOS. As you know, working for Western Union, they thought, you know, well, he works for Western Union, let's give him that MOS. But um, I learned a little bit about tele teletype, telegraph, you know, the. <clears throat> Not everything, but I learned most of it enough to to able to uh, uh, work with it before uh, during the Korean War and before we went into combat. But uh, when we went into combat, the colonel's radio man broke his ankle, so they wanted somebody to carry the radio, and they called me and they put me there. You know, so I had a hard time because I'm left-handed. And uh, the telephone was on the left side of the of the uh, the radio, so I had a hard time to taking the message down. I had to stop and uh, write the message down, the call. And uh, uh, the uh, I think I did it about a, a, a day and a half, and then they got a radio man to work with the colonel, and then they started giving me all these other. Uh, uh, job duties, you know, like um, forward outposts. Uh, one outpost, they uh, they were expecting the North Koreans to come in through this one uh, valley, and they put up two tanks uh, to fire down into the valley if they came up. And uh, they gave me uh, three South Koreans, and they gave uh, a, my fellow uh, a soldier uh, three South Koreans. They told us to. Uh, go down about uh, 75 feet and dig a foxhole and, uh, you know, to be on the lookout for the North Koreans coming in. And uh, if uh, we saw the uh, Koreans coming in, for us to run back, leave our, our three South Koreans there and notify the tanks that uh, North Koreans were coming uh, through that pass and uh, stand there and direct fire, and then go back down and get our three South Koreans. And I said to myself, that's crazy. You know, if the Koreans are coming in, we spot them. But you know, if I was to run up to the tanks, I'd probably be get shot and killed. So uh, I was given a lot of uh, uh, dangerous assignments. I, I want to interject again. Uh, so I had a few questions for you uh, before we continue on. Uh, one of them is, um, did you feel, because uh, you knew you were from a Latin descent, uh, Mexican descent, correct? Uh, that's It's Mexican descent. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel that you were given these assignments because of your color or your race? Or did you feel indignified in any way uh, from your higher ups or your sergeants or anybody? Or did you feel any of that uh, disdain? Well, uh, I, didn't, I didn't feel it for my higher ups. I felt it for my squad leader. Uh, he didn't like me ever since we were in Japan. He never liked me. So I figured, you know, it was his doing. Because every time, you know, uh, they wanted somebody, you know, for a, a dangerous mission, I'd hear my name holler out, Casas, Casas. And some of my, my fellow soldiers would, you know, turn around and look and say, you know, there you go again, yeah. And that was, you know, that was... Uh, there was a few times, but there was another one that was very, uh, uh, very dangerous. Um, we had, uh, before we went into Seoul, uh, we had a, a Marine general or colonel 
and his uh, staff member come and compare notes with our commanders our, and before we crossed the Han River. And uh, they called me and uh, the jeep driver to take them back to their posts, to their position. So uh, I had an M1 and they told me, it says, uh, turn in your M1 and here they gave me a BAR, Brownie Automatic Rifle. I had never fired a Brownie Automatic Rifle. So anyway, but I took it. I guess, you know, you're in combat, you know, you learn pretty fast, you know, how to fire it. Uh, anyway, uh, we took off and uh, run into Sewell and the city's burning, you know, and flames all over the place. You can smell the smoke and uh, flares going off, you know, and all of a sudden uh, the, the eight pulls out a map and looks at it, and then he leans over and tells the colonel that uh, uh, we were behind enemy lines. And when I heard that, oh man, I froze. And I started looking at all around the burning buildings and expecting the, South Cor the North Koreans to come out firing at us. So uh, every time a flare would go off, we'd stop and just pray and hope that uh, we wouldn't get shot at. Okay, uh, so I have a few more questions. I'm sorry. I know there's a, a more in depth that you could get with that, but I want to catch up on some of the questions. By Lydia Macias is asking a few questions here. Now, one of them you could, you know, chuckle at. You know, you could give a little chuckle to, or uh, decide to answer it or not. She wants to know if you dated any Korean ladies when you're in Korea. <laughs> that was impossible. You know, there was no time. You know, we were in combat. I mean, battle, and. Uh, in fact, I didn't ever get to see women, uh, South Korean women. Okay, cool. So that answered that question. So the next one she has is, uh, what kind of food did you eat while you were there? In Korea? Yes. Rations. Uh, it was a pre-packed uh, a shoebox full of, uh, uh, there was three meals. Uh, you had uh, cans, uh, hash browns with scrambled eggs and or different kinds for breakfast and for dinner, yeah, I mean, for lunch, you had uh, hash brown potatoes or something else. And uh, for dinner, you had practically the same thing. Plus you had uh, 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 some, f some f packed fruit. You had that biscuit that was hard as a rock and the chocolate. And then you had a pack, a three, three cigarette pack in the pack. And that was it. Yeah, no Korean food at that time. No, no. Okay, I want to get to the the next questions. Uh, also, first she says that uh, Southpaw uh, left-handers are very smart. Uh, so she wants to yeah. say that out <laughs> out yeah. loud. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we we use uh, both sides of our brain. Yeah. That's what makes us gifted. There you go. So uh, question, uh, she says, is it true uh, that big part of a soldier? duty is uh to uh, for them to watch your back at all times like somebody should be watching your back at all times but that don't sound like it i don't remember that happening too much no i don't i mean you know you you look, look you look out for each other you know i mean in combat situations you know you look out for your buddies you know uh and um so um it's 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 part of combat. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, got you don't you don't turn and and run the opposite way. You know. Yeah. Oh, so now she also wants to know. She's really into asking a lot of questions right now. I think Go she ahead. she's really in tune with what's going yeah. on with us right now. Yeah. Uh, she's asking that uh, Uncle Rudy, how long did you serve our nation? Uh, in, in the service or in Korea? Yeah, well, see, we were gonna we were gonna build up to that because he has a story of uh, serving, going into combat, and getting wounded. So there's there's some story to that. So we can get back to that question because that's gonna tie into some of the the explanation you're gonna give. Well, I can I can briefly tell you. You know, I was in Korea to, uh, in combat two months. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, from, and that from, was from from September the 16th to October the. the the fifth when I got wounded. Okay. So, uh, and then uh, one last question I see here is Uncle Rudy, did you ever sleep standing up in the swamps due to combat restricted no movement? No, we didn't have swamps in Korea. We had hard, 
frozen ground and uh, uh, frost, frost on the ground. Very cold. And uh, as I, I slept, we slept in foxholes, but uh, I sell, seldom, you know, stayed in the foxhole all the time because I had a problem with my legs. When I was a kid, about 12 years old, uh, 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 I, we had a, an accident where my feet were burnt and uh, had poor circulation. So when I was in the foxhole, uh, my feet would start, start to uh, become numb. So I had to get up out of the foxhole and walk. And uh, not during uh, uh, the combat. In combat, I stayed in, you know, but uh, uh, that's what I did. Okay, great. So that answered that question. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to put this on YouTube after. I could have did a, a live feed, uh, you know, a carryover for YouTube, but I was running behind for technical issues and reasons uh, setting up the, all of this interview. Uh, so that w that uh, answer goes out to Debbie Arajo. Um, so, okay, so that was it. So now let's, uh, that's all the uh, questions that she had so far. Uh, so now, now let's get into, um, there was another question that I had, and that was, I think maybe I did ask it already, but I wanted to also, I thought I, oh, I remember what it was. It was about the sea rations. Uh, also in the modern day times, uh, for cousin Rudy over here, uh, they have, they don't, sea rations, I guess, were for combat rations. I guess the sea was for combat. Uh, but nowadays they use what? What are they using nowadays for food? Yeah, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. MREs? Mm -hmm. So, MERS? <laughs> no, I was no. just kidding. Uh, what is an MRE? It's meals ready. Eat. Meals ready to eat? Mm -hmm. That's it. Did you, was it, well, I'm sorry, what? Oh, I was just saying. Oh, oh you <laughs> I was going to say, good, he's finally interjecting. What did you want to say? Nothing? No, actually, he, he had some, some pretty good meals in, in some of those, so maybe he can explain which one. Oh, really? His favorite no, they're not yeah. that bad. They're not yeah. like how they used to be where it's all, well, it's kind of, no, they've been proved a lot. That's pretty much it. What was your favorite? Did you have a favorite? favorite? My honestly was probably like everyone loves chili mac, but it's like beef stew was my like usually go to because goat soup, go to oh go to. I thought you said yeah. goat soup. I was like, what the? Where were you? Afghanistan, huh? Okay, no, it's all on. it's all just um, in plastic though. It's like all plastic, um, like and then you uh, they give you a heater. So you just throw it like, so you add water, you shake it up, it starts to smoke up, <laughs> and you just throw it in there. It's almost like you, you would think if you have to throw it, it's going to blow up in your hand if it's smoking like that. Sometimes they tape the ends and they make MRE bombs or out of the plastic bottles, but that's oh my, it. Something that, yeah. So that's the inside army thing that nobody really does that for like in front of the cadre or anything like that. No, they just do it. Anywhere. <laughs> so it's sort of like a little fun thing to work on. Yeah, and just, for have fun. So MREs, and so your favorite was mac and cheese. No, that chili mac. Yeah, everyone, chili mac. Everyone there you loves go. Chili mac. Yeah, oh, and Tabasco sauce. Oh, right? I know oh that's bottle. horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta have that. That takes away most of the flavor, but kicks it up a notch yeah, or two. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the meal's pretty bland as it is. Everyone, everyone complains about MREs. They're not even that bad. Uh, well, the, truthfully, uh, you know, I know about the MREs pretty well, but uh, I actually had a couple of boxes that I took home because I took our naval cadets on trainings. I had a couple of boxes left, and I devoured those two boxes. Maybe I had two left, but I lost weight. I, I don't know if that's, <laughs> if that's something that they do on purpose, but uh, eat, and I did it on purpose, you know, because I I just wanted to see what kind of fitness uh, you would acquire or, or uh, weight loss you would incur after just eating that. And I did. I lost like five pounds or that or more, seven pounds, just eating an MRE. And you know, it was like, okay, maybe. Uh, the, and I was working out a little bit too, so but um, I, I didn't like everything. Those little cupcake or brownies or whatever they put in there, and yeah, they got those yeah. snacks. They got like sugar cookies and like Skittles sometimes, and they're all old and clumped together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty old. I said probably outdated stuff. Uh, yeah, they're supposed to be fresh. It's, it has a date on there, right? Yeah, don't pay attention to that. Yeah, yeah, I've had one that was like two years older than it was supposed to be good, but still <laughs> ate it. What the really? That's not that bad. There's worse. <laughs> oh my god! Shoot, to to wow, my. So now was that given to you at training or AIT or? No, it's just per regular. In the army, yeah. Just, yeah, they got a lot of new ones nowadays, but yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah, I haven't really kept up to anything like now now times, but 
Um, I do have the little brown packets, the big old brown packets. Has your little toilet paper, your your matches, and your gum, your chiclets. Um, uh, it has your Tabasco sauce, little bottle in there. What was the most trading thing that you would would you guys trade stuff? I, I want this and I want that. I used to I I did that with my buddies when I was in basic, where um, they didn't want. Um, uh, I, I can't remember what it was. It was something that they didn't want, but I wanted, and I took it. I'm, I'll get, I'll eat that yummy. I like that. They were like disgusting, you know. But uh, did you ever remember training or eating sand in your bread? Did they give you bread in basic training still? You know, eating yeah, bread. Yeah, it came with the bread snack, the MREs. Yeah, but I yeah. mean, like actual bread. Did you guys? Oh, but then I was back in '79 and '80 when I went in. So yeah, they still had like hot A's and everything too. What is it? Hot A's. What is that? I have no idea what it means, but yeah, no, it's hot hot days. <laughs> it's basically when the when the cooks would um, they bring out food and like yeah, they'll have like eggs or bacon stuff like that when you could get it. Ooh, hot hot meal like that? Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's okay. They still bring it out in the truck to you when you're out in the field. Did you go out in the field on bivouac or anything like that? We just go on the convoys usually, or we just like sometimes like it'll be small areas, so we just go ruck out there. Really? And so, because um, I remember going on like a 15 mile hike and we bivouacked out there, pitched our tents. Do they still have tents that you put in uh, half and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, they still have half tents. And you I, buddy I up? don't really use them as much. As, no, it depends on your unit, usually. But yeah, plus uh, it's just a uh, supply and all that. Okay, so I'm going to get back to some of these questions over here. Listening to myself, that's why. I know I was very loud there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, what about the SOS? Yeah. SOS. Oh yeah, shit on a shingle, right? Yeah. Did you have that? <laughs> yeah, they had it. Yeah. With the hot A's. Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, I had a lot of stuff in the when, military. When I, when I came when I came out of service, Can, I made it for my boys. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just talking to cousin Rudy back here. I just want him to fix your microphone so it's a little bit more in front of you. Uh, I'm getting. I get, I'm just picking up a little background issue. There you go. That's better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that inconvenience, deal. Having no, that's all right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See now, I could. I got you nice and clear now. <laughs> go. Cousin Rudy, right? The, the Rudies, right here. The the tree Rudies, the trio. Uh, so yeah. So it's getting interesting. But I want to read some of the. Yeah, see what's going on here. Um, all right. So uh, Uncle Rudy, how long? Okay, we read that. Uh, did you ever sleep standing up? No. Will this be at YouTube? Yeah. In a foxhole, were you restricted uh, not to smoke? <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't smoke. The only thing that uh, I smoked in, well, it was in combat. <clears throat> Before we left for uh, Korea, um, I ordered a box of uh, Red Dot cigars. And uh, I passed it out to all of the guys because... I, you know, I I, used, I grew up watching all these war movies, you know, and the guys would be shooing a, a cigar, you know. And uh, I felt that, you know, they gave them a little courage when you go into combat. So all the guys were out there were chomping on cigars, you know, and uh, and it does it does give you that, that uh, feeling, you know. John Wayne feeling? Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's see. And then she asked, you know, did everybody smoke? But I don't think so. Not everybody uh, would smoke. Uh, who delivered your letters from uh, loved ones and how often? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I hardly got any mail. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, like I said, you know, the only, the only uh, letter I got was uh, the one... Uh, uh, telling uh, your mom telling me about uh, Christina. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a pretty important thing for uh, soldiers yeah. uh, uh, getting mail. When you don't yeah. get none, you see everybody getting. I remember having that feeling when I was in basic too, not getting a letter one time. Uh, but they did write me a lot after that. Uh, I just I didn't get some at that time. It was still too too early. But man, it's devastating. You feel like yeah. watching everybody get them, and you're just there, left there, standing around. What do I do now? I, go do push-ups or what do I do, you know? Uh, so it, it, it's nice when, when that happens, especially when you're in combat area, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, what about you, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Rudy? Did you get uh, plenty of mail at all or any mail? Do you remember? Well, in the beginning, in basic training, yeah, we got letters and stuff. But, and, uh, no, yeah, I'd say I get the, my phone back. But honestly, I just forget, because I'm so busy, I just forget to talk to him for like months. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and you mentioned something right. about phone too. I mean, how is how was it when you were in did cuz I heard something about cell phones that they would let you keep your cell phone yeah. or lock it up or make no. a phone call. In basic training, they just for me when I went in, I just I turned in my phone to my drill sergeant, they took it and then, um Yeah, that was it. And then we just go do training. They give us the the letters to the address for the for the building of a unit we were and all that stuff. So, we just send letters. Like we just go to we, every single time we went to the the defect, and then we just uh, drop it in the mailbox. What's the de- defect is the dining facility. Okay, so. okay. I thought somebody defective or just defect <laughs> person. Or yeah, give it to the defect, defect guy. Defect dining oh, defect. facility. Oh, okay. yeah. Got it. So Not we, making fun of you, but just no, no. It's just yeah, the people go. don't know a lot of this stuff, so we're educating yeah. them a lot. So that's it. Then uh, like I think it was like every Sunday we get like they do mail call, and that was it. But okay. after that, yeah, sometimes every. I think it was like every at the end of the month or every every final phase, whatever we used to do, we get a phone call. I got, I think it was just one, and the other two I don't think I ever got because of my phone was pretty garbage. We're gonna get some some input from your daddy over here and something. About- no, I, I I wrote him as often as I could, but I know he was busy, so I kind of respected that. So, yeah, so Cousin Rudy, his father, saying that he knew he was busy. So, you know, he respected that and didn't really want to interrupt him and, and uh, break up that process of training thought. So, yeah. you know, there, that's, that's understandable. Uh, there was, uh, what time, what, what was the uh, timeline that you were in? When did you go in? What year? Oh, I went in 2014. And, um, I, yeah, so that, was, uh, that was when I went to South Carolina. And then from South Carolina after Fort basic- Jackson? Yeah, it's Fort Jackson okay. for basic training. Then I went to Fort Lee. It's also Virginia. That's in Virginia. Yeah. And then from there, I went. Actually, I stayed in Virginia. I went to, where did I go? Fort Eustis. That was my first duty station. Second duty station, I went to Korea for a year. Uh, after Korea, and then I went to Oklahoma in Fort Sill. Oh, in Korea, I was in Camp Humphreys. It's like the one of the biggest posts. I stayed in Casey for a week, and then I trained in Casey, too, by the Korean border. We're doing a combat landing bridges stuff like that we worked with the armored divisions up there that was pretty cool uh it's then um after that oh also that was an aviation brigade that was a weird time so uh, you were you you were overseas at some yeah. point right in korea yeah. i went to korea all of 2018 i was in korea all of 2018 mm-hmm. okay so and be with your mos they, they, it dictated you to be in that area yeah. or? it's um needs of the army so usually that's how it goes so say if you want to go to germany there's probably no real chance of you getting to germany they're gonna throw you in like alaska <laughs> what? and then good. they say you can you can go request for this duty station but you know they really don't need you there they ain't gonna send you there unless you're like a sergeant like or with rank on your chest but Usually, uh, e well, privates, they don't get anything. That's what like he's talking about with all the hard duty stuff too. Like we all do that too, because uh, I, I mean, I used to pull guard duty. I used to on the two four nine out uh, on the the fob, all that stuff. It was, forward, op- forward operating base. The yeah, fob, yeah, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, I'd rather just hear more of his stories because mine's mine's basic stuff. What, like, what are the reasons? Well, the reason why I, I need to, you know, in, tap into you as well is because you're talking to the younger generation now that are planning on going in and serving. Mm-hmm. So it gives them an insight of what it would be like for them, you know, trying to decide this is uh, the career I want, you know, Army. And knowing how early on or how late it was that you joined, they could get some reflection on the timeline of what they would be dealing with uh so we're getting a, a back and forth thing uh, so i want to try to keep it a, keep a balance between both of you uh asking uh, uncle rudy a question and then referring back to the younger version of what it's like now uh so like the sea ration thing yeah i remember i believe we had sea rations too right kathy you had sea yeah, rations did. yeah so we had a brown box uh cardboard box and we had cans with a oh yeah and the p38 right yeah, uh, uncle, yeah. yeah the john wayne we called it did you get john wayne's the p38 no, no. That oh, that's wrong. right. You had the MREs. Yeah, the MREs. <laughs> so that's like a, that would have been like a, a some kind of historical uh, museum piece for you all uh, being in the search. Yeah. What is it? Oh, look at that! My God, they used this back then. Look at that. No, I probably still eat it. Yeah. Like, that's for dinner. <laughs> but I want to talk yeah. about uh, what was it? What was it? Mm-hmm. When I was in Korea, when they sent me over, okay. we went to uh, as some off time. We went to Seoul Tower in the middle of Seoul. Like I passed the Han River too. I I took a video too and I showed it to. My grandfather 
and then but mine was easier because i was in a cab i didn't I, I didn't have to take you should talk about that when you i don't know where we left off but when the you cab crossed, when you crossed the han river in the is the the what was it called but it's uh it's half track and you went in the half track and then because we went to soul tower and it was uh we hiked up there because uh we didn't realize there was a road you could literally just walk up to the tower we took the whole side of the mountain through uh <laughs> gutters and everything and because there was some old lady too that was just beating us for some reason because they, they they actually made like all that stuff like they used to wear um i don't know you probably saw it it was uh it was like two sticks or like four sticks they have and they carry them i forget what they call it though back in korea you mean they, on their backs yeah, yeah yeah it was like a frame and then they carry like barrels and it's crazy oh yeah, yeah so back in the day yeah. that was back in like that time during like the war a, like a backpack yeah yeah. Oh, but you say they beat you with it? No, no, no. She beat us. No, like she beat us up the mountain. She was like, oh, oh. Ass. <laughs> I thought you, you meant she beat you like no, 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 with a say. stick or something. I was no, like, but we, I just want to talk about that because he he was up in the hills of Seoul or because we went we went to the Seoul Tower just to go check it out. So that Seoul Tower is a pretty monumental place. Yeah, it's there. like a little icon or an icon. It's like a little mm. landmark. Okay, got it. So yeah, and so now we talked. To, we got into a little bit of talking about the food. Uh, sea rats with MREs comparisons um, and some of the favorite food you like uh, uh, Mac cheese or uh, yeah, it's, a, it's called chili Mac chili Mac. There you go. Uh, Theo, did you have any favorite at all? Did you find any kind of favorite food you that you had? Oh, wait, uh, cousin Rudy wants to interject here uh, real quick. I got a call from uh, I got a call from uh, Robert Casas jr. Who's who's currently uh, in the reserves uh, he's wait, yeah. He's wait, He's waiting for um, equipment to be turned in, so he won't be able to make it. Okay, all right. I just well, want to well, let you know that. Yeah, well, then, yeah. So, yeah, because we had a third chair ready for him over here, but uh, you know, I, I I was asking Rudy if he wanted to take it over, but um, I know it's a little tough sitting in city for a long time. Well, my stories aren't as interesting as <laughs> well. You know, to me, it is a bit because you created him. Uh, you and your wife created him. He wouldn't have had this story to tell us if you weren't here. So, oh, I hear a ding dong. Yeah. Are they uh, <laughs> no, but you're more than welcome to come in and sit whenever you feel like it and crawl under the table or something and get over there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, wanted, I wanted to give you that message. Too. Outstanding. Okay, so that's the message was, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, my cousin Bob, Bobby Casas, uh, who's in uh the army as well the u.s army uh, Reserve. reserves that's right he's out at uh, camp pendleton in the armory uh waiting for the soldiers to return their weapons so uh he wasn't able to make it to, uh, tonight but uh we're thinking about you cousin and uh respect and honor uh your service and time that you're taking uh to to uh uh complete your job there at the base uh we wish you uh well getting back home and and a safe trip back home uh get so we're having fun. We're talking about meals and stuff, but um, maybe, you know, it's almost like I want to talk about get really get into the meat of things now, because I know, you know, we're, we're, you know, I don't want to take you too long and uh, having you sit here for too, too much, um, because I know, you know, we all get tired at some point. So uh, let's let's dive right into um, your time when the day before. And build into Uncle uh, Uncle Rudy the time when you were getting prepared for uh, the time that you end up getting wounded. So let's take us back the day before and then work us through that. Can you do that for us? Yes. Um, after uh, um, after that, uh, we climbed up uh, the the. the the monument that he, uh, my grandson talked about, uh, was it Monument Park? No, Seoul. I'm just saying and that's, you know, it's a landmark, the Seoul Tower. Yeah. Because that's, they build a huge tower on the hills of the Seoul okay. on top. Well, you know, uh, when we climbed up to the top of the, uh, the mountain, that was called Nam San. And um, uh, that, that was the highest point uh, overlooking the city of South Korea. When we got up to the top, uh, we found out it was well fortified with uh, a lot of Russian-made uh, Gatling guns, artillery pieces, and boxes and boxes of ammunition piled up, trenches all over. And uh, 
the enemy was there uh, prior to the the day that we went up the we crossed the Han River. Uh, we crossed the Han River and uh, M tracks, or they call them half tracks now. But um, after after we were there a few days, the South Cor the North Koreans tried to retake that hill so they could get all that armament back. They attacked uh, uh, down down the down the waves. They attacked uh, F Company, and uh, while the fighting was going on, uh, our sergeant came up and asked, uh, told everybody, "Grab your rifles. We're going to go and and help those guys." So we ran towards the uh, the firing, and uh, the first trench we saw, we jumped in, and we started firing towards uh, the incoming I mean, the incoming fire from the North Koreans. Um, after several hours of uh, exchange, daylight came up and the firing stopped. And you could hear moaning and uh, uh, a lot of dead Koreans. Um, the, the, the North Koreans weren't uh, um, well suited for combat. Some of them were, were fighting with uh, tongs, and they didn't have no helmets. Uh, they had uh, an ammo belt with a box of uh, uh, cabbage and cheese, I mean uh, rice and fish heads, and uh, they were all dead all over the place. Some of ours, um, I don't know if there was any kill, but some were wounded. We helped to get them back to the aid station. Uh, before we left our spot, uh, we had one guy, one soldier guarding 17 uh, Korean prisoners, North Korean prisoners. And when we got back to our outfit, I mean, the location where we were before, uh, we found out that uh, all 17 prisoners were uh, were killed with a straight bomb, a straight shell that went uh, array and and hit hit that spot where we were before, and killed all of the, the uh, South Koreans and uh, I mean North Koreans and uh, the guy our, our fellow soldier that was guarding them. So the South Koreans uh, dug a big old hole and buried all of the body parts in, in that hole. Uh, a few days later. We were relieved from the 1st Cavalry, and uh, uh, the 1st Cavalry had broken had broken out of the Pusan perimeter where, um, you know, they were fighting the, uh, uh, the, North, uh, the North Koreans. So anyway, the 1st uh, um, Cavalry was the first division to break out, and they took up in the highway. Uh, without too much opposition, or I don't know if they had any. When they relieved us, uh, they also relieved the 1st Marine Division. The 1st Marine Division were ordered back to Incheon to embark on the ships, to go back down to Pusan and wait for us. We, in turn, we were sent down the road that the North Koreans were retreating, and the United Nations and the United States troops were chasing them. Uh, we got we got to Suwon, uh, or right before Suwon, and uh, we stayed there one night. And then uh, the following night, day, we took off, and uh, a convoy. Uh, about ten thirty that night, uh, it was cold. We were in our sleeping bags. Uh, I was in the third jeep from the front, and uh, my squad leader was driving. The driver was in the front in his sleeping bag. Next to me was uh, uh, Private First McAvoy uh, in his sleeping bag, and I was in my sleeping bag. We were tired and, you know, sleepy. And uh, the Jeeps were keeping their distance because uh, we were traveling pretty fast, and the Jeeps were stirring up a lot of dust. So the drivers had to wear goggles and uh, face mask. Um, hang handkerchiefs. So um, about 10.30 that night, uh, I heard, uh, we heard sporadic uh, uh, machine guns. 
uh, which was a familiar song with a burp gun and uh, and exploding grenades uh, in front of us and back of us. So um, they, they, uh, the first Jeep, they wounded the colonel's driver and uh, the radio man. In the second Jeep, they blew the tires off the Jeep and it went off the road into a ditch. Uh, I don't know if anybody got killed or... And the third Jeep where we were in, uh, a squad leader stopped and tried to turn the Jeep around for, uh, as to not get hit. And uh, when he finished, completed the turn and started t speeding away, <clears throat> uh, we heard, uh, I heard uh, uh, two grenades explode. Uh, well, one of them explode and then uh, something, I felt like uh, I was hit by a two by four in the back. And uh, a Jeep driver, my squad leader, after traveling a lot of ways and meeting the rest of the convoy that was following us, stopped and asked if anybody was uh, hurt, everybody was okay. Uh, the, the Jeep driver had fallen off on the, on the, when he was turning and uh, he fell there and the Koreans poked their bayonets on him and figured you know, he was dead so they didn't bother him. Uh, he got hit in the face and the back uh, uh, by grenades. I was hit by a 30 caliber <clears throat> uh, gunshot that uh, went through my chest, hit me be be below my shoulder blades, punctured my right lung, collapsed my right side, and uh, I had a fractured rib. Um, I had some uh, shrapnel from exploding grenades on my right side, my back. Uh, when the uh, when the squad leader found out that I was hit, he called the, the medics, and the medics came and uh, they uh, put me on a stretcher, and they laid me down on the ground, and I couldn't I couldn't breathe, so I pulled myself out with my left hand a little bit. I raised myself; I could breathe better. But when the when the when the two by when the bullet hit me, I just. Uh, um, I saw my whole life running, going through my family and just passing through and all these colors, beautiful colors. And all this time I was holding my breath and I had my eyes closed real tight and I was saying the, the Our Father. When I did open my eyes and I started breathing again, I could hear the uh, uh, air coming out my chest, my back, from my lung. And blood started spurring out of the uh, my chest. Uh, the medics came and they put I don't know how many uh, uh, bandages to try and stop the bleeding and the air from coming out my lung. Then they wrapped me out like a mummy, uh, and um, I passed out. They gave me a, a morphine shot and I was out. Next thing I knew, they had loaded me up on a jeep stretcher next to Lieutenant Wilson. He got hit uh, three times with a, a machine gun, and uh, he was in pretty bad shape. So anyway, we traveled. This was October the 5th, a day after my birthday. That was my, um, uh, I always think about it, that was my birthday gift. And uh, when um, we continue wait, uh, moving, I lost conscious. You know, um, I remember some things along the way. Uh, one of them was that we came up to some spot and I heard uh, bagpipes playing. And uh, I woke up and I looked to the side and there was a, a British or Canadian unit uh, standing at attention, saluting us as we went by. Uh, the next time I, I remembered was that I was laying on the floor with the other soldiers wounded and they were asking us questions. When, um, uh, when they were asking me questions, I answered some of them and then I passed out. The third time that I woke up, I, I didn't have no clothes on. I was laying in the room 
uh, dark and with other soldiers in wooden boxes with blankets on them. Uh, I woke up and uh, I happened to see this uh, uh, South Korean medic come in. I don't know what he was looking for. So I was thirsty and uh, I raised my hand, you know, to call him, but no voice, no voice would come out of my mouth. So he saw my hand raised up and he ran out of the room. And uh, a few minutes later, he came back and uh, there was a nurse and, uh, and a medic with him. And when he pointed towards me, you know, I raised my hand and she said, bring us treasure, we got a live one. So they came in and they put me in the stretcher and I asked for uh, uh, water. They didn't have the water, so the nurse uh, brought a can of uh, pineapple juice and told the Korean to just dab my, my lips, not to, uh, uh, not to uh, drink it. Uh, I was so thirsty that I couldn't, I couldn't just take the, the dabs of my lips, so I grabbed the can from him <laughs> and drank it all and I passed out. Um, the next time I woke up, I was in an ambulance. I don't know where I was going or what, you know, but uh, uh, that was it. And then the next time that I woke up, I think it was the fourth or fifth, I was in a train and uh, the medic came up and he asked me if uh, I was hungry. And I told him, no, I, I didn't feel good. So as he was walking away, I called him back and uh, I motioned back and he brought me some soup. Well, he was feeding me, spoon feeding me the soup. All of a sudden, we heard machine gun uh, blast, you know, and they blasted the windows on the top of the train. And he, uh, he, he laid on top of me just to protect me from the flying gas, glass, falling glass. Uh, and I went out again. I uh, guess every time that I wake up, you know, I was in pain and they shoot me with a, stab me with a, a morphine. Then uh, the last time uh, when I woke up, I felt myself going up, uh, lifting up. And I looked up and there was this blue sky, beautiful blue sky with white clouds. And, uh, I said to myself, man, I died and I'm going to heaven. But as I got higher up, I noticed, you know, there's some seamen. Uh, they were hoisting me up to the hus Navy hospital ship repose, USS repose in Pusan. Sailors. Yeah, sailors. Yeah, yeah. but we call them seamen. Uh, the rank of seamen E3. Uh, I just want the audience members to know. Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, as I got to the top, right away they pulled in the basket and they put me on a gurney and rushed me into the operating room. Uh, they patched me up and uh, uh, I could feel them, you know, stitching me up and, uh, uh, you know, shots and all this stuff, you know. And uh, They must have gave me something that I slept for two days. And uh, when I woke, finally woke up, uh, the medic came up and told me, you know, that uh, he thought that I wasn't going to make it. Thought that I was going to, you know, die. And here I was, you know, and here I am. So at, during this time, Theo, did uh, did you ever tell yourself at that time, no, it's not my time, or I'm going to I'm going to make it through this? Did you ever give yourself that confidence, or or you just were so out of it, you just went with whatever you felt? Yeah, I didn't. Um, I, no, I just. I just said, well, you know, um, if it's if it's time for me, you know, it's time. But yeah, I I I didn't put too much attention to it. You know, like I said, you know, I kept going out every time, you know. So you didn't have much time to really think about that too right, much. Yeah. Okay. And I want to take it back to the time when uh, uh, you were wounded, uh, and that 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 the process that one would go through. Uh, feeling like you say you were punched in the back and then going through all this process of finally getting to an aid station and then moving you to another place and then you finally they zip you up thinking and putting you in a morgue uh, uh you know the makeshift morgue there for yeah. you know and, and 
you wake up, you know, seeing you like, where in the heck am I? I mean, that is an incredible thing in itself. I mean, just thinking about it. Uh, I used to work in corner transport, you know, for three years. So mm -hmm. I went to the corner and I used to deliver, you know, deceased uh, people or bodies to the, the morgue. And, and I'd be in there for a little bit and just want to get the hell out of there as soon as I could. Uh, so that's the only closeness that I have and to relating to even knowing what it felt like being in there. But I, I knew I could get out of there, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it not knowing. So that in itself, I mean, just waking up there and by the God's grace of this, this aid coming through this Korean aid, uh, seeing you there. Do you think that if he didn't come in, you know, or do you just didn't know what would have happened to you if he didn't no. come in? Uh, like I said, you know, I was out of it and uh, I don't know what would have happened. Yeah, only uh, it's in God's hands and yeah. just it took it the way it was. Mm -hmm. But I understand you also still uh, yeah, have some shrapnel in yes. places. Where where do you have shrapnel still? Uh, it's right here and uh, inside my chest. Well, that's right. And uh, we, we we didn't talk much about that. So you got shot right there in the center of your chest, right? Right in the chest plate area? Yeah, it, uh, right before my shoulder blades and they came out right here. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Was it in the front or back where you got shot in? In the back. Okay, so you got back when that was up on your shoulder blade area, and then it came out through the chest area. Yeah. Okay. I, but I don't know if it's um, the shrapnel that's in my in my chest. It's round, and uh, so I don't know if it was uh, if it was a part of a bullet because you know they make bullets that are um, uh, armor piercing and uh, different kinds, mm -hmm. and uh, so I don't know if. Part of the bed because it, it went sort of in an angle, so I don't know if when they hit my sternum, part of it broke off, it stayed in there, and the uh, the rest of it uh, came out. So, and know, then the rest of the bullet. And this happened uh, at what time? You the date? What, when was this time? Do you recall that date and time, or the date that this happened to you? Well, you know, um, I figure about ten thirty at night because we were we were crossing. Uh, a pontoon bridge, and uh, uh, it was a old, old uh, it was a old um, uh, Afro American uh, uh, troops engineers, and I uh, heard somebody ask, you know, what time was it, and it says, you know, ten thirty. So right after that is when I got wounded. So I figured about ten thirty, somewhere did, around there. And did you know uh, anybody else in, in, that? Uh did you keep in touch or know anybody else in your squad or your unit uh, that got injured or was KIA during that that little incident? Um, not not right away. Um, when we were wounded, the colonel came and one of his his officers came a visit to us and I mean to uh, see how we were, all of the wounded, because uh, uh, we were supposed to meet. Uh, get together with the 1st Marine Division in Pusan and embark uh, to another amphibious landing in Wonsan. And it was in the eastern side of Korea, farther up north. Uh, that's where they had that uh, evacuation from um, the Chosen Reservoir. So uh, we were supposed to uh, get together there and and then hit the North Koreans uh, and Wonsan. But uh, I didn't get to go with them, you know. And um, they were fl they were flying the the troops that didn't die right there in the hospital, and the ones that were wounded, they were flown out uh, either to uh, Japan or the states. They couldn't fly me out on account of my collapsed lung. You know, the high altitude, I wouldn't be able to take it. So I was in the ship, Navy hospital ship, this one here. Uh, can you hold it up for us? So, uh, is it there so we can yeah. see it? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the U.S. Navy hospital ship Repose. Yeah, it's a USS uh, Repose. Repose. How long were you on that ship? Uh, October. Thank you, Craig. Uh, uh, from October the 7th to uh, the middle of uh, November. 
And, 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 and I wanted to also take it back a bit because I remember we were talking about this, uh, the timeline when you're on the hospital ship and things like that. And the unfortunateness of the timeline of you being wounded and being transferred from one hospital to another, the locations that you were at and how uh, everything was delayed for you because of this, which is an unfortunate thing that probably I, I'm, I'm suspecting that it happened to a lot of the wounded where a lot of their records didn't keep up with them for their promotions and their awards, their decorations and such. And that happened to you as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, when I was in Japan, I was due for corporal. And uh, they froze the ranks. So when the Korean War started, went to Korea, and uh, some of them, we heard that some of them were starting to get their ranks. And uh, fortunately, I was wounded after two months in combat. And... Uh, from from going to hospital to hospital to hospital, my records were playing catch up. So uh, nobody ever paid attention to uh, you know my rank, you know, and uh, so. Um, and know, this happened to your medals as well, right? Any of your yeah, decorations? Yeah. yeah. When I got out of the service, you know, they told me that I could uh, call the war department for my medals. Uh, I did. I contacted them, and they asked a whole bunch of ridiculous questions. They wanted witness, you know, and all that, you know, that I was there and all that, you know. And I was going back and forth, you know, uh, trying to make them realize, you know, a lot of times, you know, you don't know. So uh, I gave up. I gave up on it. And uh, it wasn't until uh, 2004 or yeah, 2005, that uh, there's an incident that happened in Iraq that made me uh, really got me mad. And I said to myself, no, that's it. So I went to Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Napolitano, Grace Napolitano in Santa Fe Springs. And I told him that I wanted my medals and compensation. But I didn't mention my rank because I, I didn't think about it. But um, when they uh, they told me, okay, they gave me a, a slip of paper with a little square about the size of this cell phone, and they said, briefly put down your, your uh, combat experience. So I looked at it, you know, and I said, can I take this home and bring it back later? I said, yeah. So I went home and I typed up three pages of the battles that we had, my friends that I lost in combat, and all of the, the details that we went through. So I took it back to them, and uh, they were surprised to see the three pages. A week later, I got a call from them and said that uh, I would be getting seven medals, and they, they didn't know when, and uh, a few days later, uh, they told me that I would be getting my medals in the uh, senior center in Pico Rivera along with uh, 11 other military veterans. Some from World War II, they were deceased, but they were gonna give the medals to their uh, uh, families. Um, uh, there was some, I think, from Vietnam and uh, uh, some from Korea, 11 of us. So they presented the medals to me, but no, no compensation. It wasn't until 2013 that I continued uh, pressing them for uh, compensation and i finally got it yeah. you know it's a remarkable thing that uh you know the process that one has to go through uh serving your country out in combat uh getting wounded and then uh transferring to hospital hospital and, and then not really thinking because at the time you're wounded you're not thinking about oh my rank and the medals or anything but yet when you finally get well enough you start realizing you know thinking back in time or your family members start bringing up uh questions about any medal did grandpa did you win any medals did you get any awards or uh, what happened with you during and then you're like in your mind i don't have i know i had some but i don't have any right now or, or just a national defense ribbon you know something that you get uh, out of boot camp or, or basic, yeah. but how was it when uh, you finally got well enough? And how long how long did it take uh, for you to get well enough for them to send you home and back to the family? Uh, and where did you go after you were well enough? Well, 
uh, I finished uh, five months recuperation in uh, Fitzsimmons Army Hospital in Denver, Colorado. And uh, they oh, we have a picture there. Yeah, yeah, that was the original. Okay, it's laying on the table. It's that one. Oh, so this is where you were recuperating uh, yeah. during this time. Most most of the time, I was in the hospital, uh, and then when they see you're getting a little better, they assign you to uh, outpatient, and they give you little jobs, you know. Uh, cleaning here, doing menial jobs, you know. And uh, I thought I'd be getting a, a medical discharge. I had uh, was that uh, five months, about five months left in my in my uh, in Lisbon, uh, three years. So uh, they asked me. Uh, uh, we're going to send you back to light duty. Where would you like to go? So I said, well, um, I didn't think too much about it, you know, but I wanted to be close to the house. So I told me, you know, San Pedro, uh, Fort MacArthur. So they, they didn't promise me if I would get it, but they uh, they said, okay. Uh, this they, was in 1950, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, 1950. Yeah, so I've been to Fort MacArthur. Now it's been shut down for so long. And, yeah. and then when you say Fort MacArthur, I could just imagine the liveliness that it was back then, mm -hmm. you know, so... Okay, I'm sorry, continue. Yeah, so uh, when I was at Fort MacArthur, um, uh, they, um, I got sick there, and uh, I spent uh, a few days in the uh, Army Hospital there in, in Fort MacArthur, across the street. Then my uh, outfit got orders to uh, go to Panama, and uh, the company commander wanted me to uh, go with them so I could interpret, you know, and um, I told him, you know, uh, yeah, I'd go. But then he says, only one condition, you have to re-enlist. And I told him, no. So um, when, they, um, uh, when they found out I wasn't going to go, they transferred me to uh, Camp Cook in Santa Maria, California, to the uh, 303rd, Company A, 303rd Signal Service Battalion. And... Uh, at the same time, they attached the Truman year. They extended my enlistment to another year. So I asked my company commander of the 370th boat, Boats and Shore Regiment uh, that I had another year. And he says, well, it's too late now. Your records are in, on their way to Camp Cook. So I went to Camp Cook, and they forgot about my light duty. And that's when the outfit was getting ready, packing all of their equipment to go to uh, this experimental atomic bomb in Vegas with uh, troops on the ground. And uh, working with all this heavy equipment, I got sick again. And uh, they sent me back to Denver, Colorado for two more months recuperating. And while I was there, they my outfit went through this uh, atomic bomb experiment and um, uh, when I got back, I met them and Cam Cook, and they were all excited because they had they had such a wonderful time gambling and going to uh, in Vegas and all that, you know. And so uh, Cam Cook was in Vegas, huh? Cam Cook was in Vegas. No, 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 no. Uh, they just uh, it was just a field exercise with the uh, experimental exercise. They even made a movie of. Uh, of that experiment is called uh, Desert Bloom with uh, John Voight, and it's in a uh, and, and it's on DVD. If anybody wants to see it, you know. And you were part of that experiment. Yeah, uh, well, I was supposed to be, but I got sick, and uh, for, fortunately for me, they sent me to Colorado, and I missed it. But it was a good thing because later on, I found out that uh, some of my fellow work uh, troops there from. Uh, the Company A, 303rd, a single battalion, uh, came down with cancer. And uh, I saw him in the news after I got out of the service. And due to the radiation of this fallout from yeah, the right, yeah. nuclear tests. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, radiation that killed animals. And uh, they were they were making a movie, Ganga's Khan, in uh, Monument Valley. 
uh, with John Wayne, Susan Hayward, Pedro Armendariz, and uh, they all died of cancer. Uh, I don't know if it was from uh, uh, from that uh, fallout, that, that radiation cloud or what, but uh, I was fortunate not to uh, have participated in it. So, so and th uh, this time you were in Colorado at this time. Yeah, yeah. When when they had the experiment, and then uh, uh, you know, and that's because they send you back because you were you came down ill again because you still weren't fully healed, right? And they mistaken you as yeah. full duty personnel, and right, okay. And then uh, from there, what happened? Well, you know, I went back to Camp Cook, and uh, uh, they, um, I just you know went back, and uh, this was in. Um, uh, yeah, late, uh, late 50, 51. And then we got orders, after a while we got orders to go to uh, Fort Hood, Texas. They were having uh, humongous uh, maneuvers and uh, it, uh, it took a whole area and they had all these different outfits and uh, we went to provide communications for all of the troops and uh, at first, uh, it was pretty, pretty hectic because it was rain, hail, snow, and uh, the mud, and the scorpions, and finally, uh, uh, we finished in uh, April. Uh, yeah, April. We were there from January to April. We came home, and uh, we came back to Camp Cook, and uh, well, uh, we were there. Uh, the company clerk came to, I was, I was on KP, doing KP, kitchen police. The company clerk came and asked, told me, it says, uh, Cassis, you know that, uh, you were supposed to be discharged a long time ago, and we just got your papers, and, uh, the, the cafeteria sergeant, uh, he said, well, you know, he's not going no place until I get a replacement. So, uh, I had to wait uh, until the, you know they got somebody. They never did, but the supply sergeant came and told me, you know, they they knew me, you know, my my story and all that, and they they felt sorry for me. But anyway, he says, uh, uh, you don't have to take all your web equip your equipment to the supply room to check it in. You know, just throw all your web equipment in the middle of the hall on the the platoon, and we'll we'll deal with it. And then, uh, so you weren't able to keep that stuff at all, being regular army. Yeah, you think? No, no, I got you? I got my regular uh, issue, but not the web. You know, like your cartridge belt, your uh, uh, helmet, uh, you know, all this other stuff. You yes, know. it's my uncle Robert. Uh, yeah. Well, so, so okay, so let me break in just a little bit because uh, uh, a karaoke friend of mine is asking. Uh, if you're my uncle, and I'm like, yeah, yes, it is. So I'm answering him. Welcome uh, to uh, the Keith Allen Show audience, Robert, and uh, congratulations on your marriage uh, to you and uh, Ruth. And I've seen their pictures and all, and just uh, well, been involved in getting this interview put together with my uncle and my cousin, uh, which is right there, you know, cousin Rudy right there, and he's uh, also served in the United States Army, uh, is in the National Guard at this, this time. He served the regular army and then uh, is serving some time in the National Guard, uh, U.S. Army at this time. Uh, but that's what we're talking about right now, the experiences and time and life of uh, my uncle Rudy, uh, the Korean uh, conflict, the Korean War. He's a Korean combat veteran with Purple Heart. Um, and now I'm going to get into a little bit of that in just a, a little while asking about, uh, you know, the Purple Heart when, uh, you know, him receiving it. And... Um, but at the same time, I want to get back over to my cousin Rudy over here and ask him uh, what he feels and what you feel about your experience uh, with your Army service time. Uh, now, did you ever study up on any of the er earlier times of the, the, the military to think of uh, like how the times were for them compared to what you had to go through? Or, well, like sometimes you look at a movie and you say, wow, I wish I was back in those days. You know, they had easier. It, was, it looked like a nice, easy time, you know, compared to these days. You know, did you ever go through that at all or think anything about, uh, you know, the time of service that 
your grandfather had to go through compared to your time of service, what has changed? If you ever think about what has changed from then to now, uh, like, has it gotten worse, tougher, more like, what the heck, you know, kind of moments? Um, anything that you can relate to? And uh, would you hear uh, your grandfather's experience of having compared to yours? Maybe for like training. Maybe, yeah, maybe training it got a lot easier just because the the equipment um, you have, you know, you don't have um, all this like harder equipment. We have like better boots nowadays, especially nowadays you can buy your own boots because the ones they issue you are pretty garbage. Oh, they, and then, uh, yeah, I think equipment wise, it's a lot better. The training's still the same. You still got to go out there and do all the stuff. I just think it's a little, it's not as well when it comes to people like the, Back in the day, you could, like, say all this stuff and, like, you know, cuss, and you hear a lot of, like, stuff, you know what I mean? Like, I heard about, like, do yeah. they did they have a red card, yellow card? Because I heard at one time they were like, drill sergeants can't be cussing you or demeaning you anymore. Yeah, did yeah you? that's, the, that's yeah. the lame part. I wish they would still do that. No, they had, they had one time they had a test where they had the, the stress cards, and they got rid of those super fast. Really? Yeah, because it's, um, that's dumb. So, uh, so they had it during your time or not? No, no, yeah, it was like I think it was before, before me. Like I don't know, but yeah, no, they no, like. That, so they could still just push being, you around and beat you up if they want to now. Yeah, they can't really beat you up anymore. But <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, not that too. But a lot of people complain a lot. It's like, I mean, soldiers complain in general, but it's all like, well, he said this to me, and it's like, who cares? Like suck it up. You yeah, know? it's like suck it up, and it's like I don't know. So it's like. Yeah, sometimes I That's think the it's the only bad thing about yeah. the army. Like a lot of people, everyone's like it's more sensitive. Like and then but then you'll go to like other units where it's like sucks. Yeah, because yeah. you don't know them very well or it, it helps when you get to know the the people you're working with as opposed to not knowing. You go into a new area, uh, a new job and then the, everybody's tight and then you're the new one. You're the outsider coming in trying to fit in. Uh, did you ever have that kind of experience while, while you're in coming to a new unit or anything? Or you just found it, you got along with everybody and it clicked? Oh, my first unit, maybe. Like mm, my first unit in Virginia because I was like my first unit. Like I was nervous. And when I went to Korea, I didn't care anymore. Like I already knew what I had to do. I just went in, yo, where's this at? Where's this at? Where's this person at? And then I just talked to sergeants, like just sorry, regular people because that's what they are. And like, <laughs> okay. I just like, all you got to do, honestly, in the military, if you could tell, like, if like what people like, you could tell who's new and who's not or who, cause like, if they're like nervous or anything, like you can tell they're new, but you just want to know where this is, you know, just go talk to them. Like, excuse me, Sergeant, staff Sergeant, can you tell me where this is at? I'm trying to do in process or do whatever. Or you want to like get anything like supplies. Can you tell me where the, the supply is I'm trying to get this or that's it? But yeah, you. What, what, was, what were we talking about? The yeah, again? I know. I, I wanted to. I, I was gonna get into wanting to ask anybody a question. Hi, Hi who's that back there? My, <laughs> uh, my grandson. Okay, that's uh, Mikey. Mikey. That, okay. That's his dad up there with a brown brown outfit. Oh, oh, hey, that looks. That is that you up there? No, huh? that's my that's my other cousin up on top. Oh, okay, yeah, he looks like you. <laughs> I thought I was like, hey, uh, that's Patrick. He's in uh, Denver right now. He just came from Korea. Who did? Who did? Uh, Patrick, Air Force. Oh, where's he at? The picture or yeah. him? No, him, Patrick. He's in New Mexico right now. Oh, he went oh. to see his friend. He'll be back uh, Monday. Any military service for you at all? Or? No, no. Just the streets, right? I mean, just that's that's hardcore as it is, right? That's like a military camp right there, mm -hmm. just dealing with what's out there in the streets. Yeah. So, uh, See, what, give me your name, Michael. What? Michael. Michael. Okay, Michael's back here with us too in the Keith Allen Show behind the scenes background audience. Uh, uh, yeah, but I wanted to reach out. I'm sorry, Uncle. You had something to say? Yeah, uh, that's Patrick up there. Oh, over here. Okay, yeah. I got it. Yeah. I know people can't see it, but they can see my arm. We yeah. <laughs> pointing up there. But uh, uh, all right. uh, Michael's dad was in Korea, also in Pusan. Oh, okay, yeah, I got it. Pusan. Wow, well, he's a military family too. Yeah. He's got that own. Wow, they are all. Yeah, well, that, like we said, it's a 
uh, military family over here. That's what we're talking about. And I'm dumping all kinds of crumbs all over your carpet. It's uh, all right. So uh, that's, that's what why I came we got for. A vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. So what I, I wanted to ask questions to anybody back here in the in our, our background audience. If you had any questions that you would want to ask that you have not heard me ask uh, to Uncle Rudy or or Rudy here, anything you could think of, um, anything that I might have missed that you feel important. Anything? I'm thinking because I'm, I'm commenting too. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure because I know there there's times when you're, if I was back there sitting, I would be, oh, he should have asked this and he should have said this or, you know, there's a lot of times I do that and I wish I was on the microphone to cut in, you know, but. Uh, uh, I, you've covered pretty much, uh, you've covered pretty much uh, yeah. questions I had. Okay. Really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm still getting into some other stuff, but I mean, I know um, we're already on the recording. We're going on three. We're going to take it to three hours tops. We're at two two hours, 54 minutes and three, four seconds now. So you mentioned, does it feel like almost uh, three hours to you, Theo, that we've been talking? Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. You can go um, more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've been here since like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. like seven hours yeah. later. I'm like, what? Yeah, we've been setting up though too, so we've been here even longer, just yeah. having to set up and get things situated here. And yeah, but we're enjoying the stories, we're <laughs> yeah. just listening because I'm. I, I well, always you know, enjoy you know what here. what uh, you know fascinates me, surprised me is that uh, you know your dad and your uncle were in Korea before me. Oh yeah, you did yeah. mention that. Yeah, yeah. they you know, they were in Korea with the Seventh Division, and then they went they went to Japan. But I, I don't think they went to Japan. They came from Korea. They did their time and they came home. I was in Korea after Japan, you know, and uh, and then uh, uh, his dad was in Korea in the seventies, I think. How old was your dad? In the how long was he in the in the army? I don't remember. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Somebody and then, here. Then now. I have my grandson, mm -hmm. and then I have my other grandson, Patrick. Bobby, yeah. He just, Patrick. just came from Korea a year there. Man, they love sending people to Korea. <laughs> yeah, no, especially that time during the whole... uh nine one eleven or... With the whole uh, nuclear bomb test, that's when I went over. That's probably the reason. Because, like, the the unit I joined was a unit for is Fort Polk. It's in Louisiana. They switched them over, and they transferred them. You know how, like, you got transferred to wherever? They transferred the whole unit. Mm -hmm. So they got... So they became two ID. That's what I was. So that was the second infantry division. It's the big old. Um, it's the uh, the Indian with the headdress. Oh, oh second yeah. infantry. Yeah, second yeah, infantry. Yeah. Yeah. It's right there yeah. in this patch. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right there. It is right there. That big Indian. I yeah. remember seeing that in the movies too. I would see it in the movies. A big old patch, just like the first calf. Is it's got that big yeah. patch. Mm -hmm. They, you know, you can't help but seeing noticing that patch as opposed mm -hmm. to the little ones. I had a question. There was a question here. Or uh, Martha Lopez. She's also our moderator on the Keith Allen show as well as Kathy. Uh, they're both the admin moderators for the show. Uh, she was just mentioning how her dad was uh, in the Korean War as well. So like I mentioned to you earlier, there's some of the yeah. Uh, people that uh, are in the show that come on or even so admin uh, her father was in the Korean uh, conflict as well uh, uh, Robert Hotto has mentioned that you know he thanks you for the service thanks all of us for service and uh, for your stories that you're sharing with us and uh, Ricky he's still joining he's still with us <laughs> you can mention that so Ricky is saying how was the pay for you or I even got, both got, of you. I got seven, yeah. when I went in, it was seventy-two dollars a month. Seventy-two dollars a month. And, well, now was that because you were going to be airborne pay, or no, was that? No, that was uh, straight out the army, and uh, airborne was part of the army. Yeah, but you, they, I heard they got higher pay if you were airborne. You get like fifty dollars oh, yeah. more. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, that that didn't uh, that didn't calculate into the pay you were getting. Uh, not then, you know. And then when you went into combat, you got combat pay because I got forty-five dollars for the two months I was in combat. <laughs> forty-five dollars extra from my seventy-two. Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't get to see them until way after when my records caught up to me. Oh yeah, so they, did you get you had all that back pay or anything when you're in the hospital and all that stuff or uh, how did they handle? Well, let me ask real quick before we get to that. What was your pay like and? Uh, in your active duty service time per month, but for like my first like, eat, I probably got like about six hundred something dollars for like 
E1, like when you first start off. It's gotten way better too, especially with the whole, uh, they just keep giving bonuses out. Like every other year, it'd be a bonus. They so still do bonus. that, huh? Yeah, not a bonus, but like a pay increase. Oh, okay, it'd pay like increase. Two, one percent. Usually, it's like one percent, two percent points. And it's like it's not bad though, you know. I don't how I don't know how it's gonna be now, especially now. But, but we'll we'll see. Pay, pay, yeah. yeah. I think what was your pay like, Kathy, back then? Do you Honestly, remember? I don't remember. <laughs> Well, I know it was lower. It was it like half. It yeah. wasn't like what like they're doing now. In Korea, now. I got about maybe like a thousand dollars, like twice a month, because I get I got hazard. overseas pay. Huh? Yeah, I got overseas pay. You got oh. hazard pay. Hazard pay, yeah. And then, well, some parts of Korea, I didn't actually get in, I didn't get hazard pay because on the in Camp Humphreys, it's uh, I think it's level three. I don't know. It was like so. It's like if you're on Casey, which is the border of Korea, you'll get hazard pay. But I got cola too. I actually don't know what cola stands for. I forget. But uh, Coca another... Cola, not Coca Cola. No, no, but... Yeah, okay. that's always think of too. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> you got soda. Pay. You know the difference between uh, my time World War Two is that you got everything issued. Oops. Everything was issued to you, so your pay was low. Now you don't get everything issued. You get a uh, lump sum a money stipend, and, yeah, and you pay for your equipment you, you buy your, your stuff own. i think in somewhat in boot camp or basic training they they issue you certain amount of stuff like one round of, yeah. of items and then I you want extra stuff yeah you you have to well the way i remember it being active duty we got everything brand new we yeah. didn't have to uh worry about hand-me-downs the national guardsmen and the reservists they had hand-me-downs and used the gear and equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one the one benefit I remember having right. over Reserve and National right. Guard was uh, we got brand new gear. Well, this was back in 79 or oh, 1980. I didn't get brand new gear. No? All uh, my stuff was uh, used. Like, it, see, from when, ac active yeah. duty? Because all, all, my, all my equipment was old. We don't get any new stuff. No, not the not your web gear and all that, but I mean your uniforms. Like when you first go to basic training, they fit you, you know, they measure you oh, yeah, and all like that. Brand new. Yeah, but, it's but all, then that's it. Yeah, and then yeah. after that you, you can, have to um, buy your stuff. You can go to yeah. CIF and then get it, but it's just you have to go through the process of getting it. It's and just, CIF it's is easier. <laughs> yeah, CIF is a clothing uh, something facility. Facility, yeah. yeah. Okay. Individual cl some clothing okay. individual I don't know. It's where you get uniforms and stuff. Yeah, you get okay. your uh, your gear, your yeah, your ACH, your uh And the uniform that buttons. explain to us the uniforms that, that we see up there on top what you're wearing. Oh, that's what that, my uniform? Yeah, or, that's uh well, what that's uh OCP. OCP. Uh, and then what your cousin's wearing at the bottom? That's a uh, ACU. That's the older no one likes that. No one likes Okay, that so that was the ACUs. Those are the older versions that are fading out. Yeah, well, no, yeah. they got rid of those entirely. Okay, got rid of them. And then the one you're wearing is yeah. one that's faded in after the ACU. Uh, is that overseas combat uniform? or is No, that... that's a standard. That with it, When I was in Virginia, that was becoming the regular uniform because everyone hated the ACU. No one... There's a huge history on that, too. Like, it's development, but no one liked it. It never worked. The only times it would work would be um, maybe... Uh, city camo or is a rocky quarries but that was it no because the, they got rid of it like that was the shortest military uniform i think that ever lasted yeah. ac yeah. the acu yeah yeah i don't remember but. and that's uh army combat uniform yeah. yeah uh let me let me get uh some let me see if i'm not passing anybody up on questions uh lydia macias uh says well thank you for that question uh brother rick uh mr rudy casas and son and grandson you're all one of a kind amen uh, Debbie Arajo makes me sad to hear this part of how you were injured. Uh, what a warrior you are, uh, Theo. I'm, I'm sure she talked. Uh, you <laughs> were you injured uh, in no, your service time? No. I mean, I got hurt a couple times, but I usually just suck it up and go through it, and then I'll just heal up. So, like, you got that something hit you or banged yeah, you? Yeah, like or? if I fell or if I like sprained my ankle, just that's it. Were you like, sober? I just suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I'm looking for remembering movies from like no, World War II. There's a different story. Like, I remember there are. Like, what? Yeah. I know. It's like, I got hurt drinking and twisting my ankle, and then uh, I came back and still sucked it up, you know, no problem. 
Uh, so let's, but that was funny. We finally had a giggle, which yeah. was good because, you know, a lot of it has been very somber and simple and, and, uh, and, and um, serious, I mean. Uh, so let, let me just read a couple of, uh, Debbie Arajo, so proud that you are my Theo. Okay, there she goes. So now she mentioned the Theo part. Yeah. Um, so that, those are the uh, only comments uh, that were left there. So we are at three hours, two minutes, and 58 seconds. So I think we should, uh, if I haven't forgotten anything, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there would be a lot. There's still a lot to really cover and continue because there's so many other little tidbits of stories of when you finally came back, uh, what did you do, who did you go with, what were you doing, you know, all this kind of stuff. But we did start with uh, your early days back in the 30s where mm -hmm. you grew up at, the schools you attended. Um, so let me just recap a little bit, uh, you know, for people out there that are just tuning in or uh, want to watch the show later. Um, so back, uh, let me see, let me get this other page. Um, this is the uh, the 20th uh, or 21st episode of the Keith Allen Show, broadcasting to you live from Los Angeles, California, every other day at 4 p.m., Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So we look forward to you to spread the word, tell your family and friends to share, uh, do your watch parties, and uh, you know keep tuning in and watch something new each time. Uh, we also appreciate you looking uh, or coming into the audience when we do our uh, 80s Mondays, our Spanish Wednesdays, and our classic rock fridays so thank you for that but right now we're here with my uncle rudy uh casas or Rulo rodolfo uh, com, uh quotes rudy casas <laughs> he's uh the the start of it all and then we have rudy casas the third here and then behind me is rudy casas the second uh so recapping a little bit here uh he, uh, let me see, uh, timeline from the 30s, uh, he was raised uh, in poverty back then, so he had to deal with that uh, during the Second World War. Grew up in an Italian and Mexican neighborhood uh, in the projects. He swam in the Alley River before it was even cemented. He rode on boxcars, on trains, or not really rode on them, but he was hanging around that area yeah. with the boxcars. Uh, he went to uh, the grammar school, Ann Street, in Dogtown. And then uh, from there, he... Uh, seen early signs of the pachucos watching all how they dressed and the unique swinging of the chains i'm sure and the hats with the feathers and all this unique stuff that was going on uh, yeah can i say some of the pachucos yes yes sir uh as a when i was 15 years old uh miss sterling christine sterling was the commissioner of overo street in downtown the heart of los angeles she wanted the pachucos hanging around at the lower part of the Alvera Street, one of the mall because they were, uh, this they didn't look, they restricting the uh, tourists. So uh, across the street there was a building, an apartment building, and uh, on the bottom floor there was a sheet metal place. Sheet metal place went out of business, so that's it. You know, so it was vacant. So Christina got the idea of opening up and starting the Pachuco Club, Pachuco okay. Club. So anyway, uh, she decorated it with a, a jute box, a dance floor, uh, chairs and tables, you know, sit, and then they put in a boxing, boxing ring. Oh, yeah. And a punching bag. Well, so, they needed uh, that back then to punch things, yeah. yeah. So um, that was for all of the, and then she issued out little card that says, member of the Macy Street Pachuco Club. And uh, I had that, but uh, when I went to service, my sisters got a hold of my stuff and... Disappeared. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there was, there was uh, um, two newspapers that wrote an article on that. The, uh, the, Daily, the Daily News, which is one of the papers that's no longer around. The, uh, um, not, uh, the uh, Herald Examiner was the other one. Mm -hmm. They wrote, they wrote a story on that for opening night. And uh, one, of, uh, one of our members from Macy, uh, they asked, you know, to put on an exhibition boxing. So one of our members matched up with one of the members from May Alpine. And uh, he beat him up. So, well, he, the Alpine guy beat up the, your member no, or the no, Pachuco no, beat up? The Macy guy, Macy guy boom. beat up, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, they weren't they weren't too good. They didn't feel too good about that. So twice they came over when nobody was there, when it was you know just one person or two, 
and they vandalized the place. So Miss Sterling twice fixed it, fixed it up. The third time they came and they set fire to it. So oh, that was it, you know. That was, well, that was no. the end of the Pachuco uh, yeah. Club. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, yeah, they were, uh, from what I've seen in all the video reels and news reels, uh, uh, it's amazing how just a dress style can really affect the brain of someone who just doesn't like it and it yeah. becomes a, like a disease that they want to get rid of, you know? You know, um, the Mexican immigrants coming here, you know, and the ones already here, uh, they didn't have the best of things. You know, like the white kids in Beverly Hills, Hollywood, you know, they were the uh, affluent districts. They had their cars and all that, you know. So the the Mexican youth, to show some pride, you know, and some, some you know, so they came up with that dress. And it was clean. I mean, it was sharp, expensive. It wasn't cheap. It's gabardine, char tin. The shoes were price, you know, prices. Uh, the hair, you know, the pachuco, the ducktail, and everything, you know. Uh, so that was good. And uh, the LAPD and the Herald Examiner uh, didn't like that. So uh, when, uh, right before or during the war, Chavez Ravine had a Naval, a Naval Academy, the armory over there, Chavez Ravine. Yeah, you I probably really, know about yeah, it. Yeah, I know. It was built in the predominantly Mexican uh, area. Uh, I don't know if this, but what I've heard growing up, going to Tenipatuca, when the women, Mexican women would go by there, you know, there was a lot of white classmen in that area that used to whistle at them, you know, show disrespect, you know, shout out different things, you know, and that's, that oh, started. That started. Yeah, uh, the conflict between yeah, the Pachucos. The Pachucos, and, you know, see a sailor, you know, and they, you know, they, they clash. So uh, they called it uh, the Zuzu riot, but it wasn't a riot. No, yeah, they like to. It was a clash. Yeah, it was a clash between cultures. Yeah. You know, well, but so long as they have the newspaper, they can put any headlines they want yeah. to on there, and they spew it out into the news and the media. The, all the population sees it, and they yeah. believe in that newspaper. So, um, that's you know that that's what's hard about people really just see one thing and believing it right away. They have to like do a self diligence uh, uh, investigating on mm -hmm. their own to make sure hey, is this really properly you know reportedly right or uh, go out and see and ask people you know what they think yeah. or what's so. Um, yeah, because, you know, I admit that I've seen so much on TV about the, the Zuzu riots and all that, but I felt bad for them, too, the way they mm -hmm. drug them all over the street and disrobed them and, you know, kicked them around. And then when I saw the sailors doing it and stuff, I was like, hey, oh, man, that's not yeah. good. Wait a minute. I don't uh, like that. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the police department and the newspaper, the newspaper ripped it up, you know, Pachucos, you know, they look like Trump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And so we haven't even tapped into that. But yeah. a lot of times I say we don't get political or religious on the show. But I can admit that uh, and I've posted on my page before, you know, that I, I I'm glad that this turned out tur uh, went the way it did. I was a Biden supporter and, and um, Kamala Harris. Uh, so I, I'm happy about the outcome uh, yeah. for this election. Yeah, um, so, so, yeah. And then so. Um, yeah, so this was, there's like I said, there's just so much. But you know what we should do? We should do another show. <laughs> we, mm -hmm. uh, we should do another one because I know that um, I'm going to look at the equipment. I'm going to look at how everything uh, is being set up, what I missed, like not setting up my camera. I have to come in five hours next time be ahead of time. Earlier. <laughs> yeah, you know, because two hours seems like it's like a lot. But, you know, when you're setting up uh, ins and outs of cables and testing uh, and then being the first time back on location, uh, you know, mm -hmm. on a remote shoot like this. Uh, some uh, technical things could just happen and the gremlins hit it and, uh, you know, we get delayed and all. But I, I really would love to come back and just uh, do a follow up uh, on a lot of stuff here uh, with regards to tapping in back into the Zoot Suit area area that you experienced uh, and, and just everything in general with the family, you know, how things were going, uh, how they found out about you being wounded, who did, you know, uh, how, th how people were feeling about it. Um, you know, and just all that. And also, I just wanted to get uh, a few more uh, 
uh, you know, some comments here uh, answered. And, and then I want to tap back into what your thought was right now before I cut you off. Uh, yeah. I know because we we're talking about that Zutsu, but I want to I just want to go over what they're saying here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so let me see. Lydia Macias had asked, I need to ask, uh, were there any young men? And she asked previously, were there any uh, women or were there any women or a lot of women during the times when you were overseas in Korea uh, serving in the army? No, well, like I said, you know, I was only there two months. And uh, from the time we landed in Incheon all the way to Suwon, I never had any encounter. We never had any encounter with women. You know, so, yeah, okay, yeah. And that was, I think she was talking about U.S. service women. Um, uh, you know, if you had... Well, served, you, know, you know, you had encounters with uh, Japanese women in Japan. Yeah, that was a different story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're very helpful That's, there in Japan. You they know. got the the uh, Okani Punanis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great to have some chuckles once in a while. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. And, and I know Rick was uh, stationed in Japan at one time, too. And yeah. I still remember I have burned in visual memories of those photos he would send my mom. Um, and uh, he would be like, yeah, look at my laundry's been done over here. And oh, my cleaner, my clothes came from the cleaners. And oh, my room's been done. You know, yeah. but they were they were a little risque at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute. Well, you know, in Japan, uh, we were in Japanese barracks, wooden paper windows and all that. Uh, and on the floor, first floor, we had a barber and we had a tailor. And uh, he used to do all the tailoring, you know, and uh, the barber cut our hair, massage our face, our feet, and all that. And oh, my God, you had the works there. Yeah. <laughs> Took care of y'all, yeah. the, the troops. And it was very inexpensive, I think, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're very inexpensive. Like, like a, I, a penny? I, I had uh, I had bought a scooter. Put, put. Oh, wow. Yeah, because well, yeah, they ride a lot of bikes over there. Yeah, well, you yeah. know, from previous soldiers, you know, and yeah. they, they, get, uh, they get to come home and, uh, you know, you don't know what to do. You either sell it to another guy I gave I gave mine to uh, my barber, you know, when when we were going to go to Korea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I told him here. You know, take here. It. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm sure he was very happy, and they, they, they I'm sure they know about a lot of that stuff going around, and yeah. you know all the the material items that they would buy, and then they can't take it. Uh, I do remember when I was in basic, one of my buddies. Uh, would buy stuff, you know, and they would be the the sergeant would be like, "What are you doing with all that stuff? You can't take it with you, you know. You got to mm. keep that stuff here. You can't take it on the bus when we should be back out of AIT and stuff, you know. You think smart when you spend your money at the PX, you know. Don't be, yeah. you know. But they would spend it on rings for their girlfriends, like five hundred dollars. You know, they'd save up for two months, and then I'm like, what the? Oh my God, the things, you know. You, you know when uh, when my battalion, the second battalion left uh, um, Camp McGill, went back to Japan. Uh, they sent me ahead of time as a courier with papers and all that. You know. uh, this is one part that I didn't deliberate. You know. uh, so they sent me back and then my outfit joined afterwards. Uh, we were given a small box that says, what you're gonna send home, it's gonna fit in this box. And some guy would say, well, I got more stuff than that. I said, too bad. So you should have seen all the stuff that we weren't taking that they had bought, piled it up in the middle of the barracks, a pile. And we had Japanese guards, you know, going around. You know, they look in the window and you could see the eyes, man, you know, all that. Because when we left, all that was theirs. Yeah. yeah so, God. Like, besides the bikes, the scooters, the cars, whatever that we had. That's a shame. All that money wasted for them thinking yeah. they're going to have it, and they didn't. But another thing, we were allowed to buy as much beer and drink as much beer as we could, one or two. Any on sake? The beer hole, huh? Yeah. Sake? Or, oh, there's yeah. another story. Yeah, I tell you. <laughs> I tell you. Yeah. There's a lot of stories to talk about. that. I, we could follow up on this kind of stuff I, for I, sure. I, I wound up, uh, I, said, I drank some soju. What's it's that? Moonshine, Japanese oh, moonshine. Moonshine, all right. And I wound up two 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 weeks in the hospital. Oh my I was, god! I was going blind. That was like turpentine. No, uh, at that time when I was in Japan, uh, sugarcane alcohol was hard to come by. So the Japanese, any product that they used sugarcane, and they didn't have enough, they would mix a uh, uh, triethanol wood alcohol, mix it in with them, 
And uh, some of the guys used to drink too much, and they wind them in the rice paddies. Yeah, my God, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I've seen little movies about that stuff too. Yeah, so they, we, uh, this this guy from Mount Tulsa, Oklahoma, and me, we drank a, a whole bottle. He was used to moonshine. I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. So I got up, man. My pupils were like this. Oh my God! So the what? sergeant said, "What the hell is wrong with you? I'm in life." Yeah, we're life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what what the hell is wrong with you? I can't see. You know everything was too bright. You know, so they sent me to uh, back to, to yeah. the base, and uh, the base they said, well, we gotta send you to hospital in in Sendai. So they checked me, you know, and they used to give me some dry drops or something in my eye for two weeks. I was there <laughs> until I was able to to focus. More of the story, be a little smarter when you drink something that, yeah. that's moonshiny, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so let's... Just um, kill a gallon of it. Uh, the, the what? Just don't kill a gallon of yeah. it one night. You can just do that. <laughs> Sip it. <laughs> Get a straw. Okay, that's enough. Yeah, we. I had the same thing. I bought the soju. And they so, it, it came in like a... You know, it was like, uh, like a gallon handle of water you know you just carry you take it to like the parties and stuff you call like, it soju like, right no no it's okay. soju yeah okay and you just buy it just the convenience store right there well you know in japan they had um they had three beers no two beers uh sapporo and uh a hockey or a kahi or Asahi. 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 Yeah. Asahi. There you go. And the Kirin one. Yeah, Kirin. No, no, no. Kirin. They had Kirin. Kirin. Those ah, two. so you pronounce it Kirin, yeah. Uh, the proper way. Asahi came later in the 50s. Uh, and they had uh, whiskey. So uh, ocean whiskey. That was a good whiskey. And then they had uh, soju. <laughs> <laughs> they had the soju, the moonshine. And uh, they had all kinds and. Some of it, when you get them in, you can see junk on it, you know. They say, no, no. <laughs> yeah. If you can, you're like, oh, no, there's something oh, bad about it. Oh, and then they had the wine, Akadama wine. Yeah, I, I drank a lot of that. I guess that was a pretty big thing back then, too, knowing that it would relax the nerve of a combat veteran being out in, in those kind of environments. I, I think even if I wasn't a drinker and I wouldn't like to drink, I think I probably would have sipped something you know, if I had yeah. to be in that kind of environment, you know, to be in a combat zone. Oh, heck yeah. No, well, I think I drank all of this in, in, in Japan. Oh, in Japan. That's right. Yeah. Before in you even in went. In Korea, I drank some uh, uh, Korean uh, moonshine or sake. Yeah, sake, yeah. And uh, at night, these South Koreans that were in their outfit brought me some, you know, and I smelled it. I couldn't see, you know, I smelled it. it good old wine, you know, so I, I zipped it. Next day, we moved out, and we were starting to climb a, a ridge, and, man, my stomach started growling, you know, oh, man, shit. And then the North Koreans started lobbying some motors. Goodness. These guys were, you know, uh, um, scattering. And I scattered to a bush, you know. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's a, yeah, that's, that's a comedy, yeah. like a Jerry Lewis movie, where yeah. it's like combat happening all around. But I'm going for uh, a bush right here. Yeah, I got to take care of business. I said to myself, "Oh man, thank God. I hope I, you know, no yeah, more no. <laughs> next year." You know, <laughs> you can imagine. Oh my God, that's yeah. so. See what I mean? That there's a lot of fun to still be had. So we have to. Definitely, God willing, we'll plan another episode uh, yeah. with you. And uh, maybe Bobby will be able to attend next time. And we'll have Bobby yeah. on the hot seat, uh, being able to talk about his stories. Yeah. And uh, I want to make sure that before uh, we say our goodnights and everything, I want to finish completing uh, what we covered. And then I want to ask any final thoughts uh, for you. So um, we had left off talking about the mural uh, that my uh, Uncle Rudy had created uh, and they photographed. Uh, he missed a lot of school due to the depression of poverty of the poverty era. Uh, went to Central Junior High School in Bunker Hill. Attended uh, Nightingale Junior High in Highland Park uh, due to the uh, Hollywood Freeway going through the Bunker Hill School. So he, he transferred over to that Nightingale uh, School. Uh, went to Lafayette Junior High in South Central. Uh, and, you know, he dabbled uh, uh, with the, the gang activity just for a bit until he realized uh, at Macy Street, that that's not uh, something that's going to lead him anywhere. Uh, so he decided uh, he's going to be a part of the United States Army and uh, decided to make a di good decision of life there. And yeah. uh, 
the rest is a history of what we've been talking about all, all day today, this afternoon on the Keith Allen Show. So with that, uh, final thoughts. Um, let me start. Uh, start. Uh, anybody? Any final thoughts? Final thoughts? Anybody? No. Every game, okay, good in the background. Great yeah. se great <laughs> session. Oh, oh. <laughs> there's a blooper. Did you hear the blooper? What did you say? What did you say? <laughs> there's a blooper. You say That's good. Know? That's going to be a blooper. We're going to have to send it. You're going to have to watch the video. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> you what? didn't hear it? You, you didn't hear your, your blooper? No. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's, w w I'll tell you after. Um. But um, so, last thought. So, let's move to you and then we'll get Uncle Rudy's last thought. Any final thoughts of. Um, your life, a career in the military, um, uh, from when you started till now. I mean, I guess. Oh, let me let me unmute you. Okay, go ahead. I got my own stories, but uh, no, nah, it's just mostly all this thing was just for my grandfather, so he could tell his stories. I mean, I got a lot of stuff I did. Some of it was pretty stupid, but. Uh, <laughs> but did you learn yeah. from it? I, I that's yeah, important. I learned how to get caught. Oh, you got caught and then learned from it. No, I didn't get caught. Uh oh, but oh, you had to get caught. <laughs> I, I, I have heard that before, you know, like if you had rank and they, why did you lose your rank while I got caught? You mm -hmm. know, if you still have your rank, uh, well, I just never got caught. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, I heard that story because I would see like in the Navy, they have petty officers uh, with gold stripes, you know, gold uh, chevrons and all. And that means they uh, immaculate career, uh, uh, no infractions or anything like that. Uh, you see red striper. That means they've had infractions or they had some difficulty time in their career. So when I see a gold striper, uh, I had asked one time, my God, you know, all those uh, chief, uh, master chief uh, gold and, you know, that's superior career right there. He goes, yeah, you might think so. I just never got caught. You know, <laughs> I, was just, I was like well, taken back by that. I wasn't thinking about that at first. You know, I just thought, hey, man, this guy's on it, you know, but, uh, you know, it's true to an extent. But, you know, I'm sure he was being hum humorous as well. Um, yeah, we just and, get ribbons, a little good yeah. conduct ribbon. That's it. <laughs> a little good conduct ribbon. So in your service time, you spent uh, four years in regular army or three years? Five. Five years in regular army service. Mm -hmm. um, and during that time, uh, what, what ribbons or, or, or accommodations have you received in that? Uh, Korean defense, uh, national defense. Uh, good conduct. Good conduct. Some other ones. I, honestly, I literally forget what I have. And where's uh, oh, yeah, that's not <laughs> yeah, I know I was like, and he had a dress uniform, but there's no dress uniform yeah. up there. Uh, but now, yeah, and I, I heard the army is trying, they're transferring into the new, the older, the early days of World War II uniforms. Yeah, they're going for a pink and green style. Uh, yeah, those, I think those are circulating right now. It's probably super expensive. Yeah, I hear by yeah. 2014 or something, there's a, no, 14, 2014, where? Yeah, so 20, they're I'm like, to switch over. You know, it's past three, two, three and a half hours. Um, and yeah, uh, 24, I think it was 2020, 34, or something around there. They were talking about when it's going to be uh, a mandatory uh, yeah. for the, all the army to be wearing that that uniform uh that's going to be a unique thing for you to see at, at some point depending on what uh, grandkids or granddaughters or people that uh, you might still have in the family serving in the army one day see them come home and you're going to look at the uniform back in it's a world war ii uniform and see like oh my what that looks like something i used to wear you know yeah. and you're wearing it as, as a new person uh, in this day and age you know um the, I, I, there's so many questions and things that people are saying here uh have you written these stories down uncle rudy um well yeah there's a lot there's a lot of stuff he's written stuff down there is a lot we're gonna we're definitely gonna catch up on a lot of this stuff on another episode because we could go on all night here and we're at three hours 26 minutes and 28 seconds 29 30. Long. yeah it, it, it isn't but uh we have diabetes so we have to we have to keep ourselves in check i gotta work tomorrow uh, and yeah, he's gotta work and, and this is another uh uh, humongous thank you and appreciation for cousin Rudy coming down. He had worked late last night. He was up to one thirty in the morning or so, maybe three or five. Didn't tell the wife and just went out and partied and all that good stuff. Or mm -hmm, got shit faced. Got shit faced. No. <laughs> so we had a, I had another giggle, but yeah. Uh, so I appreciate you tremendously coming down, even knowing that as tired as you were, you were coming in and giving us your input, hanging out with us, and and you know, uh, sucking it up. Yeah. and being a part of the show today uh so your final thought there's a lot of final thoughts uh that you were going through because you had a lot of stories uh, but any any like advice to anybody joining uh that you would say don't do it or um, uh, <laughs> watch what you're doing or honestly for my own it for what I, I would give advice it was um just um when you enter 
if you do plan on joining the military or like the army, uh, pretty much expect when you first join, expect like no one to respect you because the reason no one respects you is because that's when that's that time that transition is where you could literally drop out the next day and then you're wasting their time because you quit. So pretty much you have to take that mentality of just, you know, suck it up and just do what you have to do pretty much. Cause we all went through that. I don't know how the Navy was, but. Oh, the Navy's very yeah. easy, man. It's not, it's yeah, not, cause I was saying, not like, hard as army or Marines for sure. Because like a lot of stuff, like we, we had fights in the barracks and we do all that stuff. But I mean, like, they say, oh, no, we can't do that. We can't do this. This stuff still happens. Oh, like, yeah. You can still yeah. get your ass beat by a drill sergeant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard that with Marines, too. You know, mm -hmm. they would say they would just get another uh, soldier or, or Marine and uh, go and talk to you somewhere and you come back straightened out. They wouldn't have to do it. They just get the teammates to do it. Yeah. So you know, when I was when I was in Japan in uh, northern northern Japan, uh, there's a port there. It's called uh, Ominaro. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, and uh, well, we were there, went into town to shower and all that, and at the same time, there was a British uh, frigid, you know, dock there, and the sailors were out there with their funny uniforms and all that, playing, <laughs> playing, you know, these hoops, you know, they're running on the street with those hoops, hoops. you know. Well, like rolling them or? No, no, they're uh, hoops. With the sticks, they roll them, you know, and they oh, were yeah, laughing yeah. and all that, you know. And our troops right away, you know, they started to pick a fight with them. You know, instead of, you know, hey, let's join, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, no, you silly people. Yeah. <laughs> let's get in there. Let well, me smack you with that stick. What are you doing? <laughs> well, you know, uh, when I went in, you know, uh, I was called a nigger. Oh yeah, that's yeah, right. Because uh, you were the, dark skin, the and yeah, some of the troops, you know, and then there was other troops, you know, they were on my side, you know. And, I just uh, want to make sure he didn't have any input. I mean, because yeah, he probably has to have some final thoughts too. Oh no, I'm just saying he's he's working on his reenlistment. Oh, for additional. Oh yeah, cause I'm supposed to. So my discharge papers for the National Guard are coming out because it's actually way easier. Because I was good. Honestly, I'm going back to the army. Um. I probably get it next week, so we can. I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to save, stay for Christmas, but so that means you'd have to be shipped out somewhere else. Or... No, I have no idea how long. I might stay till Christmas. I might probably might stay till Thanksgiving or whatever. But honestly, I'm. Where would you go? This is it, and this, this is my last year. I'm gonna be here. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna spend time with the family. But uh -huh. Roger that. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm gonna go back. Back. Yeah, regular army. I don't know Back. where the hell I'm gonna go, but after this 2020, I'm, I'm out of here. Just somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. Everyone well, asked me, but it's like I said, needs yeah. the army. They yeah, care. they take you where they put you where they need you. Mm -hmm. Back to Korea. Well, we wish you got speed. <laughs> got speed getting there. Don't go to don't go to Alaska. I actually would like to go Alaska. <laughs> huh? I would like to go Alaska. You would like to go yeah. to Alaska. Well, you know, uh, see, there's a lot of there's a lot of we could. Unfortunately, we could we could really mm -hmm. go on all night. They got <laughs> like airborne. This. They got airborne out there in Alaska. <laughs> they do. Yeah. So it's Alaska. There's what else is out there? But no, mm -hmm. here it's really nice out there. It's really if you're like a city boy. No, I mean I've been to Virginia and Korea. I loved Oklahoma, like just the outside, except for all the meth heads outside. But that's the thing. You just gotta worry about those shake and bake kids. <laughs> that's what they call them shaking bakes so. yeah it's like it's oh god it's bad out there but you know it's nice the area just yeah uh, yeah. it was it, yeah i you know coming off my first leave uh out of basic uh the wolves are out there they're out there to grab your money and take your mm -hmm. money right Car away insurance dealers everything i mean just girls even oh they're 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 out there to really get you um they guys, oh, I got a better party. Let's go over to this party, a better dance place than this, this hole in the wall. And then they take you to a hotel and they're like, okay, um, yeah, let's work it. Let's do something. And we're like, what the heck? Me and my buddy, that happened to us. And we're like, this isn't not what we wanted. We want to go dance. You know, this is our first leave. Oh, really? It's going to be like that? Okay, hold on. And she gets a phone, starts calling that, like her her man, the the, the thugs or whatever, you know. They're, what do they call those guys? The, the pimps. The pimps. There yeah. you go. Yeah. I'm going to call the pimps. And then being 18 years, I just turned 18 when I was in there. 
And we're paranoid. We're like uh, seeing movies, you know, you see movies about that. And we're like, wait, 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 hold on. Wait, hold on. Don't call them. Don't call Pims or don't call your man. Oh, well, what, 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 what uh, you going to pay us then? You're going to pay us? Like, we didn't do anything. You just brought us here. Oh, okay. You know, call my guy, you know, wait, wait, you know. So here I was said we had to dish out like $50 a piece. And then uh, when we finally went to the, the, the taxi, when we called the taxi, she says, all right, well, uh, I hope you had fun. And I'm like, we're going to have fun. And, hey, by the way, I hope you have at least $10 on you, you know, uh, still, you know, left. And I go, yeah, yeah, I do. And she goes, I don't believe you. And I go, yeah, I do. 18 years old. I'm like, yeah, I do. See, it's right here. Thank you. <laughs> and, she, <laughs> and she takes on walking. You know, I'm like, what, the, man, that learning lesson I had back then about that, you know, I, I just went back and told, I was trying to tell everybody. You know, and they're just like, you know, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Whatever, you know, I'm like, oh, my God, you're going to live and learn. So, yeah. oh, there's a lot of stuff. But what I did like was, you know, we're going to get in final thoughts, but I, I really like that in um, uh, communication uh, transferring uh, or thing you guys are doing right now. Uh, you're talking amongst yourselves, you know, because you can relate to some of this stuff, you know, like we can mm -hmm. relate, you know, going on first liberties. And, uh, you know, I, I could ask you about all that, too, but that's going to take us into more stuff. And so let me get your final thoughts, Uncle, on, on uh, what you feel about in, uh, right now and um, your, your advice or your wisdom. Well, that felt good that, you know, uh, my part of my history, you know, went out to a lot of people, and I hope it was educational for them, you know, and they uh, they learned from my experience, you know, back then, you know, 70 years ago, you know, uh, Korean War. And um, so I, I'm glad, I'm glad to uh, still remember, you know, all the names and places and all that. At my age, you know. Um, yeah, a lot of them were saying that on, on uh, the audience. Mm -hmm. They are saying, wow. What an awesome memory he still has. Yeah. They're asking, well, how 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 old is he? How young is he? And uh, we, eighty nine. Kathy, yeah, Kathy had wrote down. She's commenting. Uh, you know, she's replying to people. Mm -hmm. uh, so she had told them, they're like, oh my god, what a great memory for for that his age right now. And that's uh, it, amazing. They're saying congratulations, uh, thank you. Uh, they're giving a lot of props and thank yous for uh, sharing your story. And uh, for both of you, and God bless you all uh, for your service and your sacrifice. Um, and just uh, just wanting to know, God bless America. Uh, a whole bunch of good comments there. Everybody wanted to know. Uh, so um, there it is. Well, you know, gentlemen, I had such a great time uh, hanging out with y'all. As it's been many, many years that I have ever sat down uh, with both of you or, or you uh, for sure. It's always been Uncle Rudy, uh, but there's been many years in between that we've been able to even sit down and share stories. Uh, but I do want to uh, input uh, one of the memories that I have of Uncle Rudy before I went into the service was you shared with me uh, your box of uh, the few medals that you had at that time, which was back in 79. And uh, you had showed me those medals and uh, you told me the story about when you got wounded. And uh, and showed me the Purple Heart at that time, and uh, I was in, in awe, you know, of uh, of this story because I never heard that, never knew about that. So I really appreciated that that you shared that with me before I uh, went on my path of uh, military service. Uh, so I just wanted to share the people in the audience about that as well. Um, but with that, uh, we'd like to thank uh, the. The whole Keith Allen Show audience, we'd like to thank Cousin Rudy uh, the third, Cousin Rudy the first over here, senior, and Cousin Rudy the second back there, and Michael and Kathy, my sunshine, my better half, uh, for being here with us and keeping up with the comments and answering uh, all your questions. Uh, we really had a, a great time with you, and we look forward to all of you tuning back into uh, the Keith Allen Show on Monday uh, for our 80s uh, uh, song request show. Uh, this has been a pre-Veterans uh, Day um, appreciation uh, show with my Uncle Rudy and uh, Cousin uh, Rudy. Um, and we hope that um, you will tell your family and friends to watch the video after uh, we're done here. Um, so with, with that, um, thank you for all the hearts and uh, your appreciations. Uh, this has been the Keith Allen Show, uh, show number 21. I said 20, I believe it's 21. And today, we got to say the date today because I always timestamp my shows. We are on Saturday, November 7th of 2020 on an historic day 
of a win for the Biden and uh, Kamala Harris campaign. Yeah, uh, yeah so big time celebration. Woo! Outstanding job. All right, so job, ho everyone. hopefully we can all start getting along, everybody. Yep. All right. With that, thank you very much. Uh, say your, uh, your goodbyes. And Kathy and everybody, thank you so much. We're going to fade out here from uh, from everybody here on the show. Good night, everybody. Take care of yourself and each other's. Bye now.